digital economy. And we are so proud that the government of Nigeria has already taken the bold first step to actually rename um, the, the former uh, Ministry of Communication and ICT to rename it to actually embrace this idea. We're also very proud and I'd like to really commend the Honorable Minister for his visionary mandate to develop the digital uh, economy policy and strategy document. It's really a first step in us pushing uh, um, to this new level. So we'd like to thank the Honorable Minister for honoring our invitation, for joining us today. And this also shows that the Minister um, is really, really eager to embrace the private sector in order to accelerate and catalyze the embracing of the digital economy in Nigeria. Now we need to move forward, partner with a high sense of urgency. So I would like to wrap up by thanking the Honorable Minister, thanking all the agency heads, thanking all the distinguished guests that we have today for honoring our invitation and for the NESC board and management for playing a very important role to give us, all private sector volunteers, the opportunity to donate our time to be able to help to rapidly catalyze the process of moving Nigeria to become one of the you know, strongest digital economies in the world. And with this, I'd like to um, jump into the, into the short PowerPoint uh, presentation to just give us a bit of a backdrop of what's going on today. And what is the cause of the sense of urgency that we're talking about you know, currently? So first, um, and I hope everybody can see the slide. First is, is a slide that comes from KPMG that speaks to what is happening all over the world. Globally, 5.4 million cases um, you know, happening in Africa, 115,000 in Nigeria, 8,000 confirmed cases. Right, globally, 346,000 deaths, um, um, and in Nigeria, 233. Again, um, um, so so you can see what's happening from a human impact standpoint, from an economic impact standpoint. You can see the growth rate as of January, and then what is looking at what is looking like now. South Africa negative 5.8 percent, Nigeria negative 3.4 percent. And I think the Minister of Finance is saying that this could be as bad as negative 9%. We have to see and we have to hope. And the idea behind the call today is that the digital economy could actually help us to make sure that this negative is not going to be a rapid negative. And then from a business impact standpoint, we can see what's happening from a standpoint of the different stock exchanges in Nigeria, in Johannesburg, negative 29%. The digital economy is one of the things that we are thinking can help us. So let's look at another slide from KPMG that speaks to uh, the chart on the left, uh, speaks to essentially the percentage change in the S&P 500 market capitalization. It gives us a little bit of a sense of which industries are thriving, which industries are dying or are struggling, let's, let's say that. So you can see software, indirect and direct marketing, retail, healthcare, IT services on the right, household products. On the left, you can see hotels, you can see automobiles, you can see oil and gas, you can see airlines. That's telling us a lot about what's going on. Also, let's look at this slide. It talks about the losers and the winners. We have airlines, uh, we have tourism, we have oil and gas, we have sports and entertainment on the right hand side people cannot go and have sports outside film videos you know outside because of the pandemic on the other side the winners who are they e-commerce companies logistics companies video conferencing companies entertainment streaming companies now this we're seeing a pattern here that i'm going to use to kind of build up my case so what are some of the key webinar outcomes that we expect to achieve today um, we, as the Digital Economy Policy Commission of the NESG, is very eager to drive thought leadership in partnership with government to essentially establish a platform where the policymakers of the ICT and the digital economy can essentially leverage the intellectual capacity 
the, of the private sector since the NESG has that convening power of the private sector. The second one is the public-private partnership platform. So the ability to come together to solve some of these challenges is a sense of urgency. Uh, and then the third one is the idea of a constant feedback loop essentially an agile regulatory environment that's always taking feedback and improving and getting better over and over again. Essentially, NESGA has been created to accomplish this through its policy commissions, 11 of them, 44 thematic groups. And NESGA is a dialogue partner, a connector, a watchdog, and an intervener in what it does. The Digital Economy Policy Commission, DEPC, is organized around four areas, four thematic okay, The business. first one is yeah. digital skills, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Yeah. This focuses on the digital literacy across citizens, entrepreneurs, government officials that can ensure that we have the skills. It focuses on the innovation hubs that can ensure that we have the DNA of entrepreneurship and innovation, the universities that need to adopt all of that. This is basically a private sector led coalition to ensure that all of this happens. Then the second one we have is digital platforms and digital financial services. Digital platform and digital financial services speaks to first, the platforms, the e-commerce site, the logistics sites, the ride sharing you know, uh, companies. All of these companies, how can we make sure that local companies have the opportunity to partake, right, in this emerging economy by developing digital platforms, you know, locally? Then digital financial services speaks to the fintech environment, the fintech world, all the thriving fintechs across Nigeria. How do we enable them to be successful? Um, and then the third one speaks to digital infrastructure and the tech sector financing. So this group thinks about networks in underserved areas, reducing bandwidth costs, increasing reliability. It speaks to ensuring that the tech sector has a sustainable financing mechanism by attracting private equity, venture capital, accelerators into an ecosystem that is thriving. And then the fourth one, the last one, focuses on e-governance policies and regulations. This is the thematic group that works closest with government, the gov government partners to say, what does private sector want? What are the reg regulations that will help make business a bit easier? What are the mechanisms to simplify the interface between businesses and government? So these are the four thematic areas of the Digital Economy Policy Commission. And this is the first time that we are actually presenting this to the public as part of the renewed efforts of the NESG to help accelerate the adoption of, dig of the digital economy um, for Nigeria. The outcome of these four um, thematic groups is digital citizens, digital government, and a digital private sector. So essentially we're looking forward to work very closely um, with our government partners to be able to take this forward. Once again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining this webinar today, and I will pass it on now to Mr. Ni Yusuf, the Vice Chairman of NESG, to give us the opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Bumi. Thank you, Bumi. Um, thank you, Bumi. And, um, morning everyone and I'd like to stand on existing protocols uh, but let me warmly welcome the Honorable Minister, um, the EVC, NCC and all the panelists. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the global economy and the global and global industries and Nigeria of course is not um, immune from this disruption. Our best laid plans of the government, of businesses, of academia, of even ordinary normal people have all been disrupted by COVID-19. And we are now in what is called a new normal. And that new normal is leading to reduced, reduced economic activities. And 
for us in the technology space, the new normal provides an opportunity for us to leverage technology to change the way the, we work and live. And so it is my pleasure to formally welcome everyone to this first in a series of public-private dialogue session um, by the Digital Economy Commission. And I think it's coming at an appropriate time that we also now have a Federal Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy. And so our hope at the Nigeria Economy Summit Group is that this will be one of the many series of partnerships between the private sector and the Federal Ministry. And we look to work to working with the Honorable Minister um, to implement the recently launched Nigeria Digital Economy Policy and Strategy Framework. And on behalf of the board and members of the NESG, it is my singular honor and pleasure uh, to welcome everyone to this first webinar and to express my hope that the conversations we'll be having today across the various panel sessions will be candid, will be insightful, and ultimately those conversations will allow us to explore how the public and private sector could work together to solve the challenges that COVID-19 pandemic has posed for Nigeria. But beyond solving challenges, it's also to create new opportunities uh, for us to rebuild this economy into a digital economy. Thank you and um, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alani Yusuf. Uh, for me, initially set the tone for the webinar. It was important that we got uh, the opportunity to lay the foundation of the conversations that we will be having in this webinar. And Bumi did an excellent job. Thank you very much, Bumi. Um, Olani Yusuf has just helped bring the message from the NESG for us to know that we have the full backing of the board of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group to be able to have these conversations and bring public and private sector together. I've been informed that the Honorable Minister of Communications and the Digital Economy has um, just joined the call and we will be taking his opening address or his keynote address. Honorable Minister, we're pleased to have you in this webinar. Please go on. The leadership of Nigerian Economic Summit Group, uh, other stakeholders here present, uh, Executive Vice Chairman of uh, Nigerian Communications Commission. I could not be able to see other participants clearly, so I sincerely apologize for not recognizing some by name, and I do hope that my apology will be accepted. So all other protocols duly and respectfully observe good morning and the may peace, mercy and blessings of uh, Almighty be upon you all. Uh, I'm really highly delighted to join this very important conversation of uh, Nigerian Economic Summit group today. Most importantly, discussing on a very important issue that is the impact of uh, COVID-19 on our digital economy and uh, with making reference to our country here, Nigeria. I think this uh, theme of our today's discussion is very apt. Uh, firstly, COVID-19 doesn't require any explanation today because it becomes a household name. And uh, secondly, it has completely changed our vocabularies from going to office, attending meetings, commissioning this and that, to stay home, 
stay safe. We've been uh, virtual meetings and uh, many more. So this is a pandemic that has completely changed even our day-to-day -day vocabularies. We used to spend our time moving from home to offices, from offices to meeting rooms, from meeting rooms to conferences, from conferences to commissioning project, and many more. But today, most of our activities are being conducted virtually. And the vocabularies is stay safe, stay home, wash your hand, do this and that. So it is because of this, I always say, starting from last week, that uh, COVID-19 doesn't require any explanation or introduction in the course of discussing any topic related to it. So it is because of this, I will not waste your time discussing COVID-19, but rather go specifically to discuss the impact of our COVID-19 on our economy, most importantly, our digital economy here in Nigeria. Uh, furthermore, as you all know, as uh, our stakeholders, that on 28th of uh, November 2019, my boss, Mr. President, President Muhammad Buhari, has launched and uh, unveiled our uh, national digital economy policy and strategy for a digital Nigeria. Prior to that, I made a submission to Mr. President, the President of Nigeria, and the Federal Executive Council on the need of this country to focus more on digital economy in an attempt to diversify our economy. It is because of this submission and proposal that I submitted to the federal government that Mr. President has approved the proposal and secondly, directed the ministry I supervise, that is the former Ministry of Communications to handle the implementation of digital economy in the country and at the same time to coordinate the activities of digital economy. This is what took place between 18 and 19 of October, 2019. So after that, on 28 to 29, the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy for a Digital Nigeria was launched by Mr. President, where he directed the ministry and all other stakeholders to support the federal government of Nigeria in an attempt to diversify our economy by focusing more on digital economy. In that document we have unveiled, there are around eight pillars that are very critical in an attempt to develop our digital economy. Uh, number one is developmental regulation, where we intend to use the regulatory bodies under the ministry, like NCC, NITDA, National Information Technology Development Agency, and other regulatory bodies, even outside our supervision to come up with regulatory instruments. And these regulatory instruments are not for restriction, but rather to support development. So it is because of this, we call it developmental regulation. And uh, the number two pillar is digital skills and uh, even literacy, because some people require advanced skills, some just the basic literacy is what they need when it comes to joining the digital economy. Number three, we have solid infrastructure, which uh, focuses more on like broadband penetration data centers. Number four is service infrastructure, which focuses more on providing the digital platforms. And uh, number five, digital services development and promotion. Number six, soft infrastructure. Number seven, digital society and emerging technologies, number eight, indigenous content development and adoption. So these are the eight pillars that uh, we have focused more on. Are we together, please? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Yes. We are hearing you. Okay. okay, okay, that is good, really. You, so these are the eight pillars that are part of our national digital economy policy and uh, strategy. I, because of time constraint, I don't need to go further and discuss maybe some of uh, the sayings of World Economic Forum, where they earlier predicted in 2016 that 60% uh, of the world economy or a minimum of 60% of the 
of the world economy is going to be digitalized by 2022. And with this pandemic, that is COVID-19, that has also been challenged because by looking at the way digitalization is taking place globally, virtual meetings are being conducted, uh, virtual governance are being executed. It is clearly that maybe by 2022, as long as we are yet to find the vaccine that is going to disrupt our current situation, most probably by 2022, a minimum of 75 percent or thereabout of our whole economy is going to be digitalized. Uh, and uh, so it is because of this, I think this discussion is also apt. We need to come together as Nigerians and see what we can do to leverage not only on our potentials, but rather the challenges we have, like the pandemic, to see how we can fast track our journey for attaining a digital economy in the country. And uh, furthermore, if you look at it carefully, digital economy, or rather this pandemic of COVID-19 has disrupted many of our activities in this country. And it has a very serious impact on number one, education. If you look at it, most of our schools in urban cities in the country are conducting virtual classes. But this cannot be done as, to, as of today in our rural areas, in our local governments. Some places are, are actually do not have sufficient broadband. Some of them, they do not have even the digital literacy or the skills required. This brings about the need to fast track digital skills and literacy, and at the same time, our broadband penetration. This is key because today, the hubs living in our towns and cities have privileges where they conduct virtual classes and meetings. But if you go to our local governments, our rural communities, this is difficult. And a substantial number of our children do live in our rural communities. And uh, it is part of justice that we must ensure that all Nigeria journey for a digital economy. So this COVID-19 came up with this challenge. Work life has also been disrupted. Today, our world life, work life has been changed completely. It has been our tradition that usually by 9 or 10 a.m., usually as public officers, we try to be in our offices. Sometimes we stay there up to 10 p.m. when the need arises. But today is becoming difficult because of this isolation. We are all encouraged to partake in social distancing or physical distancing. So because of this, I think it is also very important to consider that our work life has been changed, has been altered. However, that has been done in most of our cities, but that cannot be said in our rural communities. And still commerce and cybersecurity, healthcare, connectivity, and many more. These are some of the areas in which I feel uh, this has an impact on us. Uh, furthermore, we all know that in order to implement our national digital economy policy and strategy, Mr. President has also launched our national broadband plan 2020 to 2025 on the 19th March 2020 this year, just a few months ago. I believe our stakeholders are very much aware and many of them even attended the event. So in that document, our target in the next maybe four and a half years is to ensure that uh, at least 90% of our population or rather a minimum of 90% of our population have access to broadband, just a minimum of 90%. This is what we are targeting. And uh, it is because of this, even recently, I contacted uh, my boss, Mr. President, about the need of protecting our uh, infrastructure, most importantly, our digital infrastructure, telecommunication facilities, and many more. It is in that direction that uh, this week, Mr. President has directed the National Security Advisor to inform me that he has already approved his directives to be conveyed to all security institutions to ensure that digital infrastructure is protected in the country. 
So this has been conveyed to me not more than 48 hours ago. And I think this is very important. And uh, this is the time that our security agencies have been notified collectively be because prior to that, only police uh, IG was informed. But this time around, all our security institutions, military, SSS, uh, civil defense, and many more are notified to ensure that digital infrastructure is protected all over the country. And this has been conveyed by Mr. President in writing. And this is part of the impact of uh, COVID-19. Federal government uh, continues to realize how important it is to focus more on digital economy. And this has demonstrated that. And part, part of the impact of uh, digital, uh, this COVID-19 on our economy digitally, you will realize that we conducted two virtual federal executive meetings. And this is part of its impact because previously, sometimes there was resistance, but now because of the situation, almost everybody has accepted that we must conduct our federal executive meetings virtually. Why? Because there are many pending issues that cannot be executed without the deliberation of the Federal Executive Council to advise our boss, Mr. President, on the line of action to be taken. So now we are conducting meetings virtually and uh, in some meetings, at least almost nine memos are going to be discussed, deliberated. And most of the members do participate in the meetings, some from their offices, some even from other states where they travel, even for official engagement. They do link up online and they participated. And uh, the first meeting, the success rate was 90%, according to most of my colleagues. And the second one, they say it was very perfect. So why? Because we are acclimatizing, we are adopting the situation and people are becoming more and more comfortable with digital platforms. And I think this is an avenue that will support our effort of uh, diversifying our economy. And if you look at the impact as well, it pushes our youth to focus more on digital skills. Recently, we had a collaboration with IBM where they opened their portal for us. And through that portal, as of two weeks ago, more than 14,000 Nigerians have enrolled in the program online. And many of them got their certificates. And uh, in addition, NIDA also launched our virtual uh, e-learning platform. So these are some of the activities that are taking place, which I believe are very positive. And I think uh, um, this will support us to see how we can come together and fast track our digital economy journey. The responsibility is a collective one. It's not only on the shoulder of either the minister or the chief executives, but it is our collective. All stakeholders must come together and ensure that we achieve digital economy in the country. Finally, I commend your effort for organizing this event. And I want to assure you that the federal government of Nigeria is willing to join hands with you and ensure that at least whatever you come with it on board, it is going to be implemented. And at the end, I will appreciate to have the communique ready to see what government can do towards the implementation of the issues that are going to be deliberated today. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, my video. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister of Communications and the Digital Economy. It's my pleasure. I were truly honored that at very short notice, you were able to make um, this August gathering. Uh, that speaks to the priority and the importance which you place to engagements like this and um, um, the digital economy. Thank you for your time. Um, without further ado, we will break into the first plenary. Okay. We've heard from the Honorable Minister what has been done in the very short time he assumed office. The Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy was rebranded to uh, or refocused to include the digital economy because in his words, technology has to impact 
on the economy to create the necessary linkages and the advantages which is enjoyed in um, the global space. He's also been able to talk us through some of the pillars and the reasoning behind the pillars of the digital economy. Um, what we want to do with the conversation and one of the reasons why we were insistent that we had to have um, the honorable minister in this conversation is the digital economy cannot be created in isolation by government. It has to do it in partnership with the private sector. And that is the reason why we endeavor to bring in uh, people who cut across different um, sectors of the technology landscape, including um, bringing um, leaders in global certification in the person of um, Jan Day, one of the panelists. We will go immediately into the second panel, sorry, the first panel session, where we want to now begin to x-ray some of these pillars and how we can form linkages and partnerships with the private sector. So with you on this panel, we have um, Juliet Ahemwa Chazo. She is the country director for Google. We all know Google because we all use technologies that are deployed pervasively by Google. We also have, as a second panelist, Jan D. He is the vice president of global operations and partnerships for CETIPORT. CETIPORT is a Pearson View company. It is actually the leading certification or the global leader in digital certification and training through partnerships with the different um, institutions. Um, we have the honor of having um, the Director General of the Nigerian Information Technology uh, Development Agency ably represented by the person of um, Kasim. Um, so we have all these people in this panel to talk about creating digital economy for a post COVID-19 Nigeria. The COVID-19 has, um, like the minister said earlier, needs no introduction. Everybody is aware of COVID-19 children who are at home unable to go to schools right now are very aware of you know, COVID-19 as well as every um, um, aspect of the Nigerian economy. So we wanna, before we go into these discussions, I would like the other panelists beginning with um, Juliet Ehema Chazo to give us a brief two minute overview of um, the perspective of their respective um, 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 companies or representations on the Nigerian digital economy. Juliet, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. I stand on existing protocol. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would say that uh, the importance of the digital economy has been underscored by the COVID pandemic. The companies that have been more resilient and in some cases thrived during this period are largely tech enabled businesses. Just last month, right in the midst of COVID, the COVID crisis, a Nigerian startup, Tomato Joss, raised $4.2 million in funding. And if we observe the statistics from 2019, whilst we see a decline in investment in a lot of sectors like uh, oil sector, mining and so on, we saw growth in tech-based investments. According to Patek and WeTracker, the total 2019 investment into the tech space in Africa uh, it was between $1.3 to $2 billion, uh, primarily in financial inclusion, agriculture, and digital skills. Now, I firmly believe, as do many stakeholders in the industry, that you know, technology can play a very important role in growing the economy and helping to alleviate the 
economic slump that a post-COVID era, era could bring. But that, that, uh, this requires a concerted effort and a sense of urgency, which I've heard expressed so far and which is great to hear. Um, to have a successful <clears throat> digital economy, we need at least four things to be in place. One is infrastructure, robust and reliable infrastructure. And we can see that our digital uh, communications infrastructure has been stretched over this period with more people going online, several webinars and so on. We need a thriving digital ecosystem, digital skills, and an enabling environment uh, uh, provided by government. Now, these areas have been discussed in detail on uh, many occasions, and it's, it's great to um, hear the minister talk about uh, the national digital economic policy. Um, and, and so there are efforts to address this. Now, given the uh, urgency around COVID um, and the fact that a lot of nations would be looking inwards and trying to recover job losses, et cetera, on our part, it's important to look at solutions that are nimble and quick to deploy essentially purpose-built. And I would say it's important to also localize efforts at the state and the community levels. If we look at thriving ecosystems around the world, like Silicon Valley in the US or Mumbai in India, centers of excellence were concentrated in specific locations and there were concerted efforts to drive growth and investments in those areas. I think it's important that, as, uh, that this is something important to consider in our strategy, because um, if we look at, you know, even uh, rapid infrastructure expansion, it's important to, and, and, and uh, quicker to be able to localize world-class infrastructure in a specific place and help to stimulate different aspects of the emerging ecosystem, you know, elements listed in the Digital Economy Policy Commission that we heard about, um, a few minutes ago, uh, digital platforms, funding, agencies, developers, innovation hubs, to just really allow that digital economy to thrive and open up industries like business process outsourcing. This is a, a $500 billion global industry. In Bangladesh, the business process outsourcing industry rose from zero to $11 billion in 10 years. We in Nigeria have all the elements in our favor as talents, the language, a friendly time zone. And so with uh, focused infrastructure investments and uh, by the private sector enabled by government, there can be growth in this sector and it can be a huge contributor to job creation. One, the final thing I'll say as well about the digital economies, it fuels other sectors. One that may not be so obvious is agriculture. It's a sector we can't ignore because it's the single largest contributor to GDP and employs 60 to 70% of the population. We all know that right now there are challenges around access to markets, supply chain management. We have lots of farmers, but it's challenging for them to scale and so on and so forth. But we're already seeing uh, innovative solutions in this space by uh, tech startups like Farm Crowdy that are looking at outsourced capital for farmers um, and a number of others. And if we stimulate growth in the tech space, these solutions would emerge. A lot of technology-enabled solutions that can help energize that sector. One sector that was mentioned as a growth sector in the current time is entertainment. Now, this is a sector that Nigeria is great at, right? And already we see cases of exporting our creative content and culture to other parts of the world through online platforms and monetizing that content. So attracting investment from outside in, which is really what we're after when we talk about diversifying the economy. And so when we have uh, investments in those pillars, that really creates an opportunity for the creative industry uh, to be digitized and to, uh, to, to thrive to its full potential, which in turn has a, a great impact on the economy. In interest, interest of time, I wouldn't go into too much detail on the others, but digital skills, the Honorable uh, Minister already mentioned that that's really critical, having an abundance of skills to fuel this ecosystem. And of course, it's great to have government support, creating an enabling environment that can catalyze the emergence of this digital economy. 
Thank you very much, Juliet. You packed so much within that very short period. I couldn't stop writing because everything was very, very insightful and impactful. Um, we'll go on to the next um, panelist, Jande, Vice President, Global Operations and Partnerships of CETIPORT. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be with this group today. Um, it was, if I think back, um, about uh, early this year, February 20th, I had the opportunity to sit in the office of the Honorable Minister um, and have a discussion with him. That was the last face-to-face -face meeting that I actually was able to have. My return from Nigeria to the United States, once I was here, I was quarantined and I've been working from home um, using virtual technology ever since. Now, to some that may not be much, but to me, um, that's very significant. Um, I, I feel like it's important for us to understand the impact that this has had, this COVID-19. However, I also wanted to emphasize this, that um, prior to COVID, the Honorable Minister um, had the great vision and insight to look at the different uh, digital skills requirements and such. This is not something that is new um, with the digital or national digital economies uh, policies and standards uh, or strategies. Uh, the ministry has focused on the need for basic digital literacy for a long time. The COVID-19 has done nothing more really, I think, than put a magnifying glass on that. And I think that we've all become more acutely aware of what is needed and, and such. So with that, um, one of the things that I have had experience with in the past 25 years in working in the education side of um, IT is that I've watched the evolution of the technology come to pass. The internet has become the global equalizer for all economies. Um, I have observed where we have uh, individuals working on marketing campaigns from across the globe uh, to su support people in New York City or London or, or Lagos. Um, architects can work from home and do their drafting and, and plans across the globe. We have become a global community and biggest and emphasized um, effort came through the invention or the implantation of the internet. The problem is, is that many of our people are not skilled and not able to use the technology that's afforded to us today. So in my mind, the key element for the development of economic and skills or economic in the digital world would be the development of skills and in individuals and in human capital. And I am honored to be able to be a part of this. And this is what our company does is we help to support that uh, trend and training and, and uh, certification and validation of these skills. So with that, I truly believe that this is a, a wonderful direction which we're going with um, today to build the digital um, economy of Nigeria. There are tens of millions of Nigerians who have potential that is untapped. The Nigerian people are an industry, industrious people, an educated people. We just need to give them the tools to be able to be successful. And with that, I, I hope that we can work together to do so. But my, my emphasis, I think, today is we need to start and start now. Because every day that we delay moving forward is another group of individuals who miss out on the opportunity to become digitally literate to be um, contributors to the economy. And with that, I just will open for other, I've got other items that I'd like to share, but I'll reserve those for when we have question and answers. Thank you very much, Jande. Uh, putting it succinctly, digital skills, um, which forms the pillar number two of the digital economy policy and strategy is a critical component underscored by country director of um, Google, Juliet, as well as Jande. Um, let's hear from um, the representative, another public sector now, um, the representative of the Director General, Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency, as to his perspectives on the digital economy and the role they can play. Kasim Sodangi. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, good morning. Um, on behalf of the Director General of, of NIDA, um, Mr. Kashifu Inua, who is unavoidably absent and he sends his apologies. Other sessions where he's participating, other sessions that were arranged earlier. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, that um, the brilliant opening by our Honorable Minister, our Erudite Minister, has captured essentially what the position of the government is and then the role of other agencies that are supervised and under the auspices of the Honorable Minister with the leadership of the ministry in driving the digital economy program, thankfully, insightfully, and also precisely, the, the digital economy plan came into existence, you know, just before the um, outbreak of the COVID. It was so prescient in some of the issues it highlighted and sort of structured so that we can, we can deal with these challenges in a coherent, you know, and a sensible manner. The, the primary role of NIDA within the digital economy plan is the twin mandate of regulation and intervention or development. They're actually complementary and then they work and, and you know, um, depending on what side of the coin you look at it. Um, the, the regulations of NIDA also as brilliantly uh, elucidated by the minister is actually for development and issuance of developmental regulations. The regulations of NIDA are geared primarily at driving, at building, at harnessing all the capacities that are available in Nigeria to be able to deal with a manner in, um, the, the challenges in a consistent and coherent manner. So the regulations covering data protection, use of IT, IT shared services, you know, use of infrastructure within the government, ETC, are all geared towards facilitating you know, the readiness and capacity of government to offer uh, digital services to the public to solve problems within the, 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 the society and to also harness the capacity you know, of government. I would say directly that COVID has simply placed the challenge on government to find, to explore even exponentially and quickly, you know, ways that it can offer its services in an expedited manner to meet the needs of Nigeria, thankfully using, you know, digital technology. It will mean reorientation, acculturation. It will mean changes in culture, technology, and even ways of working and capacity to be able to ensure that government you know, is delivering on the mandate or on the responsibility of government uh, to the people of Nigeria in terms of provision of services. I'll say that we will look at this in two ways quickly. First is things that were being done pre-COVID. Um, NIDA had, you know, pre-COVID had issued, you know, uh, during the tenure of the SYL, Director General of NIDA, who is incidentally the Honorable Minister for Communication and Digital Economy today, the Nigerian Cloud Computing Policy to support the use, the ubiquitous use of that resource, you know, cloud computing in delivery of government service. NIDA had passed and, you know, had issued the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation, which is the frontline framework for protection of personal data as we digitize and process personal data, you know, throughout the economy from financial services, telcos, and, uh, and so on and so forth. NIDA issued the IT, uh, the public sector IT clearance, you know, uh, framework and guidelines, essentially being able to streamline and ensuring that the investments done in information technology, one, are in consonance with best practice, global thinking, and are also optimizing value so that the resources of government are used judiciously for the promotion or for the for the to facilitate service to the public through you know information technology and um and um through information technology and digital services um others are the interoperability framework to drive interoperability so that government data is understood and used as for the for the purpose of whole, whole of government and for planning and so on and understanding you know all the input that can come from inside from data enterprise architecture to ensure that you know how government is set up to deliver services and so on so not to bore too much with just the things that have happened i'll say that but post covid post the pandemic you know the outbreak nida has, is ramping up certain frameworks that should be of um um that should be of interest to us first is the government digital service framework uh, that will come on stream in about a fortnight. That framework is designed primarily to ensure that government agencies understand the method, understand the methods and the capacities required to drive government digital service. Another is understanding the public-private partnerships to ensure that even in terms of fiscal constraint and uh, uh, finances, 
public sector can partner effectively with the private sector to deliver government digital services. Others are, there are also frameworks on co co-innovation on innovation and ideation by the public sector in partnership with all kinds of firms across the strata of innovation in Nigeria from startups to scale-ups to MSMEs that are indigenous. So all these things are being considered and will be on stream so that we can accelerate resources, capabilities, so that government can ramp up and deliver you know, services. Uh, like the Honorable Minister mentioned, the NIDDA Academy is now on stream offering digital services, one inward focused to government, building out capacity for government in that regard. And then again, just building out the teaming youth and those and dealing, trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, the digital, the managing the digital divide, ensuring that we close up the digital divide and improve, you know, the knowledge of Nigerians in um, uh, the digital economy and participation in the digital economy. So these are some of the just initiatives and approaches, you know, NIDA has taken within its mandate as a constituent of the Nigerian um, um, digital economy plan, you know, of the federal government. And then it's driving this to ensure that government digital services meet the needs and challenges of the COVID era so that we can provide quality services, you know, for our people. And I'll, I'm hoping at some point I can talk a bit more about local content and need this approach to local content, again, under the leadership of the ministry to build the capacity of Nigerian companies and grant them access into certain aspects of the economy to deliver quality services and build capacity. So I'll leave it for I'll leave it here for now until you know the question and answer sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kasim. You've done um, justice to um, the entire uh, strategies that NITA is currently employing pre and post COVID to drive a digital economy. Thank you very much for that summation. Um, let's go into directly now questioning. And I'm just going to um, start off with Bumi. Bumi as a, um, Bumi here is wearing two hats. He's also the CEO of Venture Garden Group. Um, as, a, as a business owner, how has your business been impacted by COVID now, uh, you know, as a Nigerian technology business? Can you give us a sense or a perspective? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Chris, for the question. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think so many good things have been said already. Um, but for specifically for, for me, uh, we run a company called Venture Garden Group, um, where we deliver um, payments and data solutions to different sectors. Um, we also run an investment house called Greenhouse Capital, where we invest in um, tech startup. So I'm going to talk about impact from those two dimensions, from uh, operational companies and from an investment standpoint. So from an operational company standpoint, you know, we have five businesses, one in aviation, one in power, one in education, one in payments, and so on and so forth. And it's almost a case where our aviation payment business went down by 90% overnight, you know, so imagine waking up um, you know, you know, overnight and literally 90% of your income is gone. And I think that really reflects some of the things that, you know, people are feeling out there in terms of like, you know, entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, we also have a, a, a payments company where we actually specialize um, in helping banks develop uh, cross-border technologies for moving money. Um, now, all of a sudden that business was booming, right? went essentially double, triple. So, so um, what's the moral of the story? For me, I think it's a case where uh, businesses are hit really, really hard, especially ones that are not well diversified, right? Um, the second lesson there, so the first lesson is diversification. Second lesson is all the hundred or so employees that we have on the aviation business, literally in 30 days, we had to create a brand new product that's focused on the cargo business. So what's the moral of that story? That adaptability, right? So, and I think that's where the resilience of the Nigerian people com comes in, the ability to basically pivot. So I, I think that's the experience from the side of Venture Garden Group, the operating company. So from the investment company side, where we actually make investments, I think Juliet uh, talked about the numbers earlier um, I also spoke about the numbers. The continent attracted like 
almost $2 billion, and Nigeria brought in almost 40% of that. That's massive. And that's really what we are seeing. The appetite for our foreign investors you know, to invest in Nigerian startups is huge. It's massive. And for me, the story there is that how can government and private sector work together to catalyze that investment? We don't need to create new things. We just need to accelerate what is working, especially from the standpoint of attracting capital. So we have a company called Helium Health. That's one of our earlier uh, uh, investments. And they basically automate everything end to end for hospitals. They just raised um, $10 million during the pandemic, right? So during the pandemic, these guys are raising capital. 10 cents from China is one of the big investors, you know? So we're kind of seeing that companies that are able to pivot very fast have the ability to succeed. But we also think that public sector has a role to play to kind of see how can they provide the right interventions and policies to help to support these companies, these fintechs and tech startups so that they can actually survive. So um, I, I think that's pretty much um, a good sense of, of our experience from our side. Diversification is key. Resilience is key. Adaptability is key. Attracting capital um, um, is key. And then government support is very key. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bumi. Um, you put it very well um, with respect to the adaptability part. That that is a that is the resilient Nigerian spirit. Um, a crucial part of this webinar is to empirically assess the impact of COVID nineteen on uh, Nigerian businesses, and for us to achieve that. We, we have a survey that is currently ongoing. I'm sure um, the team can share the link on the, on the chat for different business owners to take a simple four minute, um, um, 10 question survey to give their impression as to um, speak to some of the things that Bumi mentioned with respect to partnership with government so that government begins to approach the subject matter from an empirical perspective and not just because they feel these are the policies that should be delivered. I will direct my next um, question to the Honorable Minister. Um, the e-government master plan was launched in 2019 and that master plan is the blueprint, blueprint for a digital transformation within the government. Um, we all know that if the government is not digitized in terms of building capacity within the government, they might not be able to um, implement the digital economy. By our last estimates, um, there are about 25 initiatives, which um, if an investment prospectus was delivered, developed for that particular e-government master plan, it will be in the region of a billion US dollars. Now, in terms of funding the e-government master plan, which we believe is a critical aspect of the digital economy. How does the honorable minister plan to fund this plan, seeing that there's been a huge drop in all revenues? Hello, Chris. Yes. Uh, yes so yes, the I can. minister had to attend another meeting. So myself and Mukhtar are here to answer questions and relay the information to him. So I'll just answer your question. And if Mukhtar okay. is here, we'll also chip in as well. So concerning the e-government master plan, um, like you stated, for us to accomplish everything written there, it actually costs quite an amount. But the thing is that each and every MDA has a budget that is allocated to them that has to do with that sort of relates to the implementation of the plan. So it's not as if the ministry is going to fund everything. We're going to play the role of coordination and ensure that the other departments, other agencies, other ministries key in. So when they are spending things on ICT, we ensure that it aligns with what we want to do in the e-government master plan. The representative of the DG need that had mentioned earlier about the IT clearance committee. So apart from trying to ensure that government has value for money, the IT clearance committee also ensures that there's some kind of synergy and that um, 
every ICT project that's implemented by government is complementary. So that's one of the ways that we're going to use, we're going to fund, we're going to support the implementation of the e-government master plan. The other way is to get partnerships. Um, before the COVID-19 caused the lockdown, there was supposed to be a program that was coordinated by the ministry in partnership with the World Bank and with COICA, that's the Korean um, Agency for uh, Cooperation. And it was focused on the implementation of the e-government master plan. So World Bank was supposed to bring some kind of support in terms of um, providing capacity building for e-government officers, as it were, across the country. They're supposed to come into Abuja for that training. So things like that, we're doing some, we're having some partnerships with World Bank, with COICA, um, African Development Bank, and any other um, forms of partnerships we can get will really be helpful. So um, our approach has been to lay down the policy, identify what needs to be done, get support from the agencies, get support from the private sector, and also get support from developmental partners. Thank you very much, uh, um, Femi Adeli. Um, I will come back to you. We will not uh, let uh, the Honorable Minister off that early. We have quite a number of um, 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 topics that we will like to go through. But let me move my next question to Juliet. Looking specifically at Google, there's a number of programs um, I saw that Google is investing in uh, building over 200,000 um, Nigerian developers, um, the, the Google Skill Up Night, um, Night Africa that seeks to train 10 million people. These uh, programs seem to be music to our ears. How does Google want to achieve this in, in partnership with the government? or uh, just take us through some of those programs that Google is looking to. Sure, thank you very much. So um, Google has, uh, right from the inception uh, in Nigeria, we've been actively investing in helping to build the digital ecosystem along with partners in uh, private sector and government. One of the areas is around digital skills development. We understand the importance of you know, people having access to uh, the right level of digital skills so that they can participate in the digital economy, create opportunities for themselves, um, and uh, also help to uh, create jobs for, and opportunities for other people. And so in 2017, we pledged to train 10 million people across Africa. And this is a combination of online training as well as, as classroom-based training. Uh, the training modules are also available on uh, a mobile phone, uh, accessible via even uh, basic feature phones that we know uh, are still in the hands of uh, a huge percentage of the population. Um, now, we've been administering this training uh, through partners across the country, and we've also had collaboration with governments to help scale the program in uh, different parts of the country. So, for example, we partnered with the Office of the Special Advisor to the President on the Sustainable Development Goals to uh, reach over 100,000 people across the country. Uh, we've partnered with state governments to roll out and they're just different partners um, across the country. Um, the, uh, in addition to that, we see the importance of um, providing uh, 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 skills enhancement uh, with developers, training developers so that they can build apps that people can engage with. They can create solutions to local problems using technology and that would really help to fuel uh, to a digital activity. And so we pledged to train 200,000 developers, really going deep around you know, building mobile-based and web-enabled uh, en solutions. We're doing that in partnership with Andela, Pluralsight, and uh, Udacity, just uh, leveraging online curriculums and uh, um, offering an Africa scholarships program through which people have you know, free access to these modules. These are some examples. Um, we also firmly believe in technology entrepreneurship as well as homegrown entrepreneurship as having the potential to really contribute. And if you think about the figures I mentioned earlier, including the figures shared by Bumi, the tech entrepreneurship space is a very critical one. And so in addition to these initiatives, one area that we've really invested in is 
um, developing technology startups. We have a Launchpad Accelerator program, uh, which provides three months worth of mentoring and equity-free um, uh, uh, support to uh, growth stage startups to just really help them grow their businesses. Okay, thank you very much, um, Juliet. I asked that question particularly because um, the digital skills pillar of the digital economy um, uh, policy and strategy is a very critical um, um, pillar because if the citizenry is not uh, um, digitized and also the um, government itself is not digitized, then we cannot achieve any digital economy. So in, in my um, um, thinking, I'd like to direct this question to Kasim uh, uh, Shodangi, who um, already set the tone for engaging local, um, the local uh, capacities in Nigeria. So the COVID-19 pandemic has actually alerted us to the fact that we have to grow our local capacities. We've said this, you know, um, severally. How should we be positioning ourselves to grow that local capacity because we keep hearing the word technology transfer but i don't see anybody transferring any technology so what sort of policies um, um does need that um, look to put out there to drive that local participation in the digital economy same way um, the Koika people, uh, the Koreans, they did same way the Chinese did, and um, every other um, 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 economy that has actually developed their digital economy. Kasim. Thank you. Um, as a background, um, in around 2013 and before the NIDA had started the engagements, and there were several engagements and even policy statements on um, on on local content in 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 ic sorry please let me just mention we're actually trying to hello yeah i think we lost chris for a second okay so I was trying to respond. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, in in um, twenty. Well, trying to so if you okay. can just keep Chris, the other participants uh, opportunity. To... You, have you joined us? Yeah, please okay. go on. I could just go. Yeah, thank you. So in twenty thirteen, NIDA had issued the initial and first um, guidelines for Nigerian content development in local content. It was the culmination of efforts driven by stakeholders and the lead you know, um, agencies of government at that time involving Nigerian Computer Society, ISPON Institute for Software Practitioners and so on um, to come up with a plan to deliberately drive the development of capacity, local capacity in ICT. What that framework essentially did was to um, dimension and analyze areas where Nigerians had sufficient capacity, areas where Nigerians could build capacity and sort of actions that were required to continue to drive and to consolidate on capacities that were local. Um, thankfully, Nigeria has a, you know, Nigeria has a diversified to some degree skill base that allowed Nigeria to not start from zero, but to start um, to, to provide certain services based on existing business models that were in country. Um, the plan was implemented starting actively 2015 when um, the, the government recognized that local content in IT was a thing to be reckoned with and a thing to be done. And then subsequently the executive order of these administrations was issued first, the executive order 003 that mandated certain capacities and certain products were to be you know, prioritized for procurements from local vendors. And then eventually the insightful and I think brilliant executive order 005 that consolidated on saying any, in any sphere where Nigerians had capacity to conceptualize, deliver and maintain and support services, um, you know, Nigerians must be considered at every stage of the product where these capacities you know, exist. Now these three documents, the guidelines from NIPDA, the executive orders of the, the presidential executive order 003 and 005, you know, became the full crumb for driving you know, local content. 
uh, this you know has been done and driven through um, enforcement and compliance frameworks of NIDA. NIDA was even forced at some points to consider prosecution for those who went afoul of his laws or regulation um, when it came to when it comes to provision of local content. This has formed sort of the context in 2019. The SWL uh, DG of uh, Kasim. I yes. may need to interrupt you a bit. Um, okay. We're running far behind um, schedule. If you could round this up in one minute and then subsequently um, speakers should try to go straight to um, the point and just you know hit the nail on the head. Thank you very much. Okay. So as it is, NIDA is implementing the executive order 003-005 and then the guidelines for Nigerian content. This is being done actively through the framework for IT, IT project clearance, which ensures that all the provisions and the requirements of local content as issued by the presidency and the guideline on NIDA is being complied with in delivery of services through the public sector by local capacities. Then lastly, I'll mention NIDA, as I said, NIDA is developing a framework of the private sector so that there's co-ideation and co-creation of innovative solutions from the public sector in partnership with the private sector for delivery of service in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kasim. I The Nigerian Economic Summit Group is a veritable platform. We have the largest collection of private sector think tank, um, and we've been doing this for a very long time. So we are open to engagements to make some of those conversations more robust such that we could bring in a lot of the ideas and the expertise which we've, um, um, we have in, in private sector administration. My concern again goes back to the Nigerian Human Capacity Index, which stands at 0 0.34. Um, we perform very poorly with respect to um, this last measurement um, by the World Bank. And I would like Jan to help me um, evolved strategy. Nigeria, we want to, you know, uh, get about 10 million digital natives in, in 10 years. How feasible is that? And what sort of strategies do you think, Jan, we can, we can employ? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'll try to make this brief, but there are um, five key elements of success that I think that we need to address or at least consider. First of all, we need to set um, a standard. Um, what is it that we really want to achieve? Now, from a digital literacy and a economic ability, we've got a number of agencies who have already looked into this, like the uh, Global Digital Literacy Council or UNESCO or the European Union uh, Digicomp uh, groups, um, the American Council for Education. I think we look to those people to set the standard and, and make sure that we are accomplishing what is going to be beneficial. Second item is that we need to have measurable outcomes. Um, when I, uh, a while back, I spoke with uh, some folks at World Bank and with uh, USAID, and they talked about a lot of the funding that they're putting out towards programs like this. Um, for them, it was easy for them to identify the value of their investments when they were to build a building or to, um, inoculate uh, and, and vaccinate a number of people for disease because you can see the results of that. When you do education between the ears, what is it that we can, how do you measure that? And that's been always the difficult thing. So they love the fact that we have certifications, uh, whatever the standard is, however the training is done, we need to have something to validate the skill through measured outcomes. The third item is we need to have top-down policy. Um, government is at the top and we need to have passionate people who are dedicated to make sure that this happens. And it's not just a flash in the pan, as some would say, that it happens momentarily and, and is forgotten, but it needs to be something that is sustainable in the government uh, policies and, and thoughts. It's the um, fourth item that I would look at is bottom up economic development. What is it that business is looking for and how can business on the grassroots help us to be able to receive those people into um, the economy once they've been trained, certified and validated? The final thing is teachers, teachers and teacher training. Um, it is imperative for us to be able to have at the teacher level the support that we need. 
We need to have incentives given so that teachers can help drive the programs. Without incentives, I believe that we will struggle with getting the results that we want. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean cash incentives, but there are a number of different things which we found to be successful across the globe that can help teachers to be able to help themselves and their students and the general population uh, to be able to succeed. So I, I try to be brief, but I think that there are five elements there that are essential for success. Um, and again, it's just the, the passion I think that we all need to carry with us to make sure that this happens. Otherwise, I think it will die on the vine. Okay, thank you very much, John. I like um, the fact that you came with so much. Um, we will be getting the presentation slides and hopefully everybody who um, participated um, during this webinar will be able to download the presentation slides that were given by the different participants. Now we have an audience in YouTube watching this streaming, um, 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 this webinar. I think we lost Chris for a second. Um, I'm guessing he's about to go over some of the questions from the um, audience for the panelists. Um, so we'll see if he- uh, Digital skills. Okay, he's back. Chris is back. Okay, okay, we lost sorry. for a second, Chris. Okay, okay. Okay, we've lost Chris again. <laughs> Okay, while we're waiting for Chris to come back up, um, I believe he's moving to sort of wrapping up with, you know, last comments from everybody, um, probably incorporating um, a little bit a of success from model. the audience. Okay, Chris, yes. we kept losing you back and forth. Can you just uh, 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 summarize again? We lost anything you said. Um, I think you were about to do your wrap up with questions from the audience. Okay, sorry. I'm very sorry, um, uh, connectivity issues. The, the question for the audience, one of the questions from the audience speaks to revamping the curriculum in um, our schools to address digital skills. And I'm sure Jan will have maybe one something to say about this, but for me, we have a success model with the triple helix model. Can you take us a bit through uh, a model that is successful with respect to revamping curriculum in primary and secondary schools? Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, definitely for, for this aspect of, you know, um, digital skills, which for me, when we think about digi digital skills, it's applicable to digital skills for citizens, right? So that they can consume government services, digital skills for government workers, so they can actually serve the public citizens and serve the businesses, right, for a vibrant business environment. So how do you translate those digital skills to these, you know, government workers? Then you also have digital entrepreneurs in terms of how do you make sure that all entrepreneurs, no matter what the sector is, right, that they're using digitally enabled business models. So how do you teach that to them? So that's the scale of what we're dealing with in my mind, right? Now, now add COVID-19 to that, which has now accelerated this sense of urgency. Now, the whole purpose of this session today, so what do we do? Where do we go from here? And how do we accelerate the efforts around that through partnership? And a reference point is that triple helix model that the, the Nigeria educational system has actually started to adopt it. So I believe towards the end of last year, an MOU was signed between the Nigeria university system so key universities, the Nigeria University Commission, the key regulator, right? The Ministry of Education, right? And the private sector under the umbrella of NESG. Now that is very powerful when there's a sense of urgency that says that, okay, we realize that the educational system is broken as is today. We realize that us as government alone don't have all the answers. We realize that there's an ecosystem of universities that have to be at the table 
We also realize that the industry is actually the consumers of the graduates, right? So they know what they want. Bring everybody to the table in one agreement with clear KPIs, with a sense of urgency, with a timeline, with accountability, with a secretariat, with a PMO that is tracking how we execute that. For me, until we start talking at that level, right? It's still a talk shop. And the risk that we have as a country is continuing to think as a talk shop, right? The risk we have is if we're still thinking in isolation. So for me, the right outcome from the session today will be a situation where the government institutions come to the table, right? The agencies come to the table, the industry comes to the table. There's actually a signed agreement. There's a PMO that executes. There's clear KPI that says you train 1,000 students, uh, 1,000 teachers in three months. It goes to 10,000 in 18 months. You are accountable. We come to the table. We have a webinar like this and measure the effectiveness of everybody at the table. I okay. think okay. if we do that, we're in business. Okay, Bumi, I thank you very, very much um, for breaking that down. We are going to only be able to take about two additional questions and I want to give the other uh, participants an opportunity to just talk before we just have our summary and our closing um, um, statement. There's another question. This is from um, Chris Uwaje. Um, he says, before we forget software, what is the core competence of Nigeria in the digital transformation ecosystem, software or hardware? Juliet, this speaks directly to um, your area. Can you help us um, um, answer this question, please? Sure, thank you very much. Absolutely, software development is critical. And that's why I talked about uh, developers, investing in developers, because we need to think about an entire ecosystem that needs to come together. You need users that are empowered to be able to use and access these digital tools and platforms. But you also need the, you need the service providers that provide the platforms, the infrastructure. You need the developers that would build these great apps that solve problems that people can engage with, et cetera. Which is why we've invested, we're investing so much in training uh, 200,000 developers um, and uh, focusing on uh, the needs of this environment. We know that this is a mobile friendly and uh, in many cases, a mobile only environment with people having their primary internet experience via mobile phone. And so the training is very much around, you know, building web apps and, and mobile apps, et cetera. But I think more holistically, even in schools as well, um, we have created some uh, developer student clubs because a lot of these skills can be picked up early, right? And, and actually the earlier, the better. And so we have uh, developer student clubs where uh, students that are not necessarily computer science students, but that have an appetite or interested in um, uh, technology can, can engage. And I think this is something that uh, needs to happen at scale. Thank you very much. Um, just to um, recognize the presence of Right Honorable Lego Idagbo, he is um, delivering a paper in this session and uh, hopefully uh, she'll be able to give us the closing um, remarks. Thank you for um, being patient enough to join this first session and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot um, from you later. We also have Akin Oyebade who is the special advisor to the state gov government. He has a very fresh and unique perspective. So it will be nice to hear from him as well. This speaks to my next question and this goes directly to Kazim. Sorry, Kazim Sojandi. Victor Udo wants to know that the need for a data protection and privacy law cannot be overemphasized. Now that the public and private sector are embracing IT, and digital economy during the COVID-19 and the post-COVID era, how do we get there as a country? This is, we're talking tangibles now, Kasim. Is Kasim on the call? Yes, I am, thank you, thank you, okay. thank you, good question. Yeah, it gives um, you an opportunity to talk about the local content strategies you wanted to talk about earlier. That, so. but, but to even speak about data protection a bit more um, specifically, because that's what he asked, um, we know that the, the regulation, the Nigerian data protection regulation that has been, that is currently being implemented by NIDA has been received, you know, has been received resoundingly in the industry, particularly around, you know, finance, telcos, 
um, health insurance, you know, and so on, we have seen tremendous support and tremendous, you know, feedback in the initial audits in reporting cases of breach and investigation of breach, you know, and some sanctions, you know, where these have, have occurred. But we also understand particularly that the, the regulation was needed, you know, as an interim regime until a proper law, you know, comes, uh, is being passed by the parliament for enforcement of personal, the protection of personal data in Nigeria. That is being discussed at various levels. There are various drafts that are going through all the iterations to ensure that it addresses our specific challenges as a country. While the GDPR is a fantastic model, it captures what a model law should look like and a modern law should look like for data protection. We have other needs and other specificities of our society, which we must take into consideration in building out, you know, data protection, a data protection regime that actually works for Nigeria. We must take into account, for instance, the capacities available. We must take into account the histories and the culture within, you know, our private sector and just the things that we may need to do. We may need to go lower than Europeans and then accelerate certain things and also eliminate certain, you know, either vexatious, thorny or ambiguous ideas, you know, uh, like right to be forgotten and so on, you know, within, you know, the real European context. So we're developing and um, fashioning out a law that will deal with both the global, you know, challenges around data protection, but also the specific needs of our local community. So that's coming on stream. It's been driven actively by the Honorable Minister for communications and digital economy. For local content, um, I'll quickly say that it is local content is prioritized. It's important that we continue to see, and it's incremental. So we must also be careful not to approach local content from a very static standpoint of the, the issues of local content today may not be for tomorrow. So it is important that we also calibrate the right tools that are needed to drive local content as technology is dynamic, obsolence is real, and there's sort of the challenges and spaces we can play as part of the developing, as part of, you know, a, a country in the developing economy, and then our global reach and our advantages, some of which Juliet mentioned brilliantly, so that we can continue to adjust these things and achieve the goal, you know, we need to achieve for local. What is key and pertinent is to understand uh, the technology changes and we need to be dynamic. You know, thank, thank you very much. I am very sure that uh, Kasim, we will take this conversation because I see you have a lot to talk about. We're going to take this conversation out of this platform after the webinar. Um, now we can, we, I'm afraid we cannot take any further questions from the crowd because we're um, far gone on time spent. I would now begin to give our panelists um, the opportunity to just summarize and you know, give a sense of perspective as to, um, um, you know, just give the closing remarks. And I'll start with Jande. Yes, thank you. I know we're short on time, so I'll make it brief. Um, we've discussed a number of things, the five elements which I discussed, I think are critical. Um, getting 10 million uh, people to be digitally literate within the next uh, five to 10 years is would be a challenge. However, um, we've experienced in uh, the state of Florida, 2.5 million people already um, certified in the past year and a half to two years. So we've got a um, track record where this is possible. And I'm very confident that we can make something happen if, if everyone on this call gets behind it and makes this work. Um, I'm very passionate towards helping um, to bring people into the digital age and uh, I would represent myself as well as my company as any way we can to help that we will. Um, the final statement I think I would like to make is if we're going to do this, let's start now. Um, we can't wait, we need to move quickly. So thank you very thank you much, very much. great day. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, John. Um, Juliet, closing remarks. Thank you, so I think this is a very important time to be talking about the digital economy. And there are plans in place. What is really paramount is our ability to come together, private sector and government, to really deliver and execute on these plans rigorously. Um, my hope and optimism, optimism comes from the talent that I know exists in this, in this um, environment. Nigerians are very talented people, very creative. 
all the programs we've run, we've had some amazing success stories. So for example, with our digital skills training, to date, we've trained over 5 million and there have been some amazing success stories. You give people the tools, just simple tools, and they do amazing things. That's the stuff of the Nigerian spirit. And that's part of the enthusiasm and hope. But also the fact that technology tools um, are incredibly powerful and, and can create transformation in every sector. We've seen uh, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning being used in agriculture, in cassava farms, to automatically detect uh, diseases and identify the solutions to those diseases. And so there's no reason for us to be behind. We have everything that it takes to overcome the current uh, challenges in the global economic space. It just needs a concerted and deliberate effort with a sense of urgency. And it's my hope, as well as I know a lot of stakeholders, at this great conversation that we've had today and, and acknowledging the NESG for putting this together and everyone um, participating, that uh, you know, the plans and the efforts would continue and even be accelerated so that we can realize this potential that we talk about um, in Nigeria that we, know, that we know exists. There's no reason why we can't get there. Thank you very much, Thank Juliet. Um, we, we're honored to you know, have your fresh insights. Uh, Kasim, can you give us one minute, please? One minute, just give us your closing remarks. Thank you. As this is the largest collection of private sector in Nigeria, I'll say quickly, um, I'll need those frameworks that I will be, will, will be, will hit the, uh, will be showcased soon. One for digital services, the other for co-creation and ideation between the public and private sector will provide a very um, interesting platform to see how we can ideate and resource digital services, you know, post COVID going forward. We know that government revenues and um, revenues and budgets will be challenged, but then again, these models would allow the private sector work effectively with the public sector to deliver services to the public. So I enjoin um, all the participants here to follow very closely so that we can see how we actualize those platforms. Thank you very much, Bumi. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, it's been a great opportunity to hear from the Honorable Minister, to hear from NIDA and all the great things that they're doing. I, I think it's important that we also, you know, in, in our own little ways, celebrate progress, right? I think a lot of times we more like look at everything and say nothing is happening, nothing is happening. So I, I, for me, that's where I'll start from, right? So private sector needs to have a little more empathy for public sector, public sector needs to engage proactively. And I'm hoping that the Digital Economy uh, Policy Commission represents the platform to create that bridge. So that's one for me. Number two is solving this with the kind of concerted effort and sense of urgency that Julia spoke about earlier. It means that we cannot work in silos, right? So meaning the government, the different government agencies have to come together on their own it means private sector also have to come together. It means the educational institutions have to come together. It means the three parties have to come together as well. That is not, that sounds easier than, you know, you know, practical. I mean, it's not easy. I know it's not easy. So a forum like, like this, I think it's very, very important for us to drive all of that. We know the potential is there. We know that we need to move very, very fast. The key is, do we have the hunger do we have the sense of urgency to really, really drive that? So I'm hoping that from today, we can see that type of effort, potentially modeling this after the triple helix uh, our model um, in terms of having an MOU across all of these different parties to drive this into execution mode. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Bumi. Are we hearing from the um, Honorable Minister, is he still on the call? Sorry, okay. he's had to join another. Okay. Okay, okay, go on, go on, Femi. You're still here. You can yeah. just close out on this okay. section, please. Uh, sorry, the minister had to go for another meeting. Um, so he's looking forward to getting the details of the communique. Basically, like he said when he presented, the ministry is looking forward to partnering with the private sector because it, we cannot do it alone. And you know, the um, COVID-19 has been an unlikely trigger 
for the embracing of the digital economy. And it's important that we ensure that the momentum is um, not stopped and then we can get as much as we want to do concerning the NDEPS and the broadband plan through the partnership between the government and the private sector. And we invite you all to participate in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Femi. We will be taking you on on two of those um, um, only branches you've uh, shared. Um, yes, at the end of this, we will uh, put together a communique or an industry position paper that we will share with all the participants. We will capture the thoughts and the directions that um, the different panelists have come and um, curate this into a document that will form an actionable uh, uh, plans. Now, just to speak a bit about those plans, um, in the past, we put out the communique and then it becomes a document that is another document. But the NESG strategy has always been to find quick wins, um, projects that the private sector can implement or execute very quickly within the short to medium term on their own. And then projects that we will require partnerships, uh, co-creation like uh, Kasim Sojandi uh, mentioned earlier, we would identify those projects and the one that governments exclusively have to do um, on their own, which um, speaks to the setting the tone for the business environment or developmental regulations. I want to use this opportunity on behalf of NESG to thank all the uh, uh, panelists in this initial plenary. This plenary has come to an end, but by no means the webinar um, um, continues. Um, Juliet, we thank you for um, sparing some time from your very busy schedule. Jan Day, thank you so much all the way from the United States of America. We thank you. We look forward to your visit um, um, to Nigeria again. Um, Kasim, um, greatest regards to the DG. A couple of conversations we started. We look forward to continuing those conversations. And um, um, Bumi, see you in the next one. Thank you, guys. So um, these panelists will drop out and we'll move to the next um, item on our agenda which is a paper to be presented by the Right Honorable Lego Idagbo. We will do the introductions as soon as we um, take about a minute to bring on the next set of panelists and the paper presenters onto the full view of your screens. Thank you all. So agenda right now is showing up on your screen. We have um, two papers. We actually had more papers to be presented, but because of time, we, we can only take um, two. Um, a brief introduction, um, Right Honorable Lego Idagbo is the chairman local content um, monitoring and um, development in the National Assembly House of Representatives. Um, he's been at the forefront of championing um, a local content uh, bill. And uh, prior to now, um, a local content, uh, uh, government's perception about local content has always been oil and gas. And we cannot say we blame them because 90, about 90% 90 of our revenues and income actually come through oil and gas. But um, um, ICT is making a very strong claim, getting up to 14% of the um, um, current GDP and, and it's positioned to do a lot better. So this is the, the reason why we decided that we needed to have um, the Right Honorable um, Lego on this uh, uh, platform to be able to give us a presentation as to how the local content bill will incentivize or drive local innovation, which is critically needed, and also to protect the integrity of our information assets and, and data. We would be hearing from him in the next minute or so um, um, for his paper. 
So, Honorable Lego, you have the floor. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is just test running my audio and video. I hope you all see me very well. And I we hope do. you hear me too. We do. Go on, please. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let me formally introduce myself again, even though Chris has uh, done justice to that introduction. I am right, Honorable Lego Ibago. Uh, by the grace of God, I happen to be the chairman House Committee on Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar. And um, Chris, yesterday when we spoke, incidentally, I was in my constituency. I was not too sure of the network there, but I'm speaking today from Calabar, which is like a, a three and a half hour drive from my constituency. So I made that drive in the morning just to be part of uh, this webinar. That underscores the importance I have for this webinar. It's important to me because it's coming at the time where as a committee, we are sponsoring the Nigerian Content Development and Enforcement Bill. Uh, before now, like Chris had mentioned, local content was restricted only to the oil and gas sector. It's had its successes, it's had its, it's, had its challenges, mostly successes. And I will tell you, just a brief story of the successes of uh, the local content bill, which was signed into law in 2010 in the oil and gas sector. Before the local content bill was signed into law, the oil and gas sector was dominated by expatriates. Nothing, the Nigerians were begging for crumbs, even in their localities where oil operations were taking place, they didn't have a say. So the Nigerians clamored for a bill that would give them a say, which is, I mean, which is what happens in every other crime. Luckily, the National Assembly rose to the occasion and uh, this bill was passed and signed into law. The benefits of this bill, what the bill sought to achieve was basically to say that, let us see how we can grow capacity in that sector and let us see how we can grow capacity of our indigenous companies and encourage them to do well in the sector, you know. And um, we've had successes. I'll tell you a story of uh, Lavin Energy. Lavin Energy is one of the companies that were able to lay hands on the funds because there's a deduction of 1% from every oil contract that has been awarded. And that deduction of 1% is put in a trust fund that is overseen by the board, NCDMB, Nigerian uh, Content Development and Monitoring Board. So the board oversees that fund and the work in partnership with Bank of Industry. So Bank of Industry was able to give out some funds to some Nigerian companies and Lavin was one of the beneficiaries. They built capacity as a result of those funds they took part in the sector because there's a provision in our law that says if a foreign company comes to do business in Nigeria, you must work with a local partner, a Nigerian company. So that way, there are certain things that are stipulated in the bill that should be handled by only Nigerians. The Nigerian company that is your local content partner will ensure that those things go to Nigerians. And as they are doing that, they are building capacity. That way they can compete because the oil and gas sector is a closed sector. If you do not have any experience in the sector, it's difficult for you to gain entry into it. They'll ask you questions like, have you done anything oil and gas before? So you need to show that you have. Today, Lavin Energy is, is winning bid rounds in other countries, in Equatorial Guinea, in Benin Republic, they are winning bid rounds for oil blocks in those countries. And those are huge contracts. Why are they winning these bid rounds? Because they've been able to show capacity back home in Nigeria. And these other countries look up to us. Tomorrow, 
with what is happening, you never can tell. They can begin to win contracts globally, even in the UK, in Asia, in the US, and so on. So that is what the oil and gas sector has been able to achieve. One last example in the oil and gas sector is uh, oil Oilsev Oil Save built the longest gas pipeline in Nigeria, and they got their funding from Bank of Industry, this 1% deduction that was made uh, in the sector and domiciled under the, the watch of the board in Bank of Industry. They got their funding. They did that job. Today, they won the contract for AKK. I'm sure everybody knows what AKK is. Is the Ajokuta Kaduna Kano railway line. Uh, Oil Save is the major contractor. Now they are having to look for technical partnership with the Chinese. So the Chinese have now come in as their partner. You know, before it would have been them coming in as a partner to a foreign company. Now a foreign company is having to come in as their partner to handle some technical issues. So as a committee and as a house, we saw the successes and we decided that it was important that we expand the gains that had been achieved in the oil and gas sector to every other sector of the economy. And I must say this here, that sectors are different. If you do copy and paste, you're going to get it wrong, particularly with ICT. ICT is a sector that is peculiar. What ob obtains in ICT may not obtain in construction, may not obtain in, a, in a manufacturing, of course, in oil and gas, in agriculture, in health and other sectors. You know, so we must treat every sector based on their peculiarities. That's why in our bill, we had a lot of omnibus clauses. This bill will be circulated to every stakeholder, to every sector. We had cause to engage with all the sectors. We invited the Minister for Communications. Thankfully, the, uh, the DG, is it DG he's called uh, NCC? Yes, Executive Secretary, Nigerian Communications Commission was with us, he did a presentation. Nita came to uh, the National Assembly and also did their own presentation on how they thought the ICT could function best. And we're able to capture all of that into our proposed law. So now if I'm to speak specifically about ICT, what we are trying to achieve is post COVID-19, because this COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear that Nigeria has to reverse the trend of being a net importer of information and communication technology. We need to begin to look inwards. Someone said COVID-19 has presented challenges to the ICT sector. I would rather want to say it's presented opportunities to the ICT sector. Opportunities that if the ICT sector can key into, they would grow with unprecedented pace. In Nigeria, for instance, I, won't, I don't know, but I think the ICT sector is challenged and we need to take this opportunity that COVID-19 has presented because everybody is going ICT. See this uh, webinar we're having today. Uh, on a lighter note, three, four weeks ago, someone called me and said, I've been invited to a webinar. I said, what does webinar mean? They say, no, it means you will go online and make, I said, I cannot stress myself. I don't want to go into all that trouble. Anybody that wants to see me should come. Let's meet physically and discuss. And look at me today. I know how to set it up. I know how to navigate everything. Needed to call someone to show me how to do all of that. And this is me functioning in a webinar and speaking to you fine gentlemen. You know, so it's not rocket science. Anybody that thinks ICT is rocket science is being misinformed. In other climes, people that are not even educated go into ICT and rise to the pinnacle of it. They tell you stories of how people like uh, Mark Zuckerberg were dropouts of school, probably Bill Gates and all the rest of them were dropouts of school. This is because you do not need that advanced education to be an expert in ICT. The time is calling and it's now that we must expand and build capacity inwards and in country in ICT in Nigeria. This bill we are proposing 
is to institutionalize local content across all sectors of the economy and protect startup businesses seeking to participate in the digital economy. Whether we like it or not, the economy has gone digital. It's no longer analog. Everything that used to happen in an analog economy with the coming of COVID-19 will cease. Even if COVID-19 goes, which we all pray it does, but because of how we've learned this new way of life, it's more convenient, trust me, than to ask people to travel back and forth for meetings. Uh, recently, Twitter sent a message to all their staff that they don't need to come to work ever again. You know, and that's to say that with technology, you can work effectively. So moving forward, I think that our local content bill channeled to uh, ICT is the best thing that will happen to Nigeria. But again, I'm just a legislator. I'm not an expert in the sector. So I don't have all the answers and I don't know everything. But all I'm saying is that we're providing a platform, a legislative platform where you can interface with us and tell us that, okay, A, B, C, D is what we want to see happening using your legislation in the sector. And of course, we'll oblige you. We've sent out communications to every stakeholder. We've sent out communications to your minister, a draft of our bill, and we're asking you to send memorandum and we're going to engage with you, not physically because of COVID-19. We'll engage with you, webinars, Zoom meetings, conferences, and all that, just to get your input and tailor our bill in such a way that it gives you guys in the sector a fighting chance. All we want to see, because we must protect our country. It's on head of where you see foreigners coming to manage our data. Tomorrow, if something happens, God forbid, they have the power. They can shut us down. They have all the information that concerns us. So we need to build our own local companies that will manage our data, that will take charge ICT-wise. See what's happening in Silicon Valley. Why can we not have one of such in Nigeria? The Indians did it in uh, the city of Bangalore. The Indians now control their ICT. And so many young Indians are MDs in Fortune 500 companies. We can do that for our country using this local content bill. So for us, we've provided this platform and we want you guys to key into it. We want to have robust engagement with you guys. We want you guys to look at all the details of our bill wherever we need to put in certain specifics, tailored driven towards uh, giving you guys robust opportunity in the sector indigenously. You let us know and we'll be sure to do that. Uh, again, I thank you. I hope I kept to my time and uh, I'll be prepared to take any questions <laughs> as they arise. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Um, we will, I think questions can be taken at the end of the session. We will go right um, into the next paper, but uh, very salient things you, you, you mentioned. We are happy to work with um, your team. We have received an official request from your office as an official memorandum to bring in our input. And um, currently as a policy for the, uh, uh, the Digital Economy uh, Policy Commission, this is top of mind in our priority list because we feel it is an opportunity to speak to areas of um, the Nigerian data protection regulation, um, localizing imputes um, into um, um, e-government projects coming in from um, the federal ministries and to, to have Nigerian companies sort of like be the ones to build up that digital economy. Thank you for your time. And um, we um, apologize for the drive we had to make you go through, but uh, I am sure that um, if the digitization process gets to, you won't have to make that drive next time. Thank you very much, sir. Thank we'll you. have you Thank towards you. the end. Um, we go on to the next section of um, this webinar. We have a distinguished um, professor in our midst. Um, his name is uh, Professor Motayo Fakinlede. 
is being at the forefront of building local capacity um, in the areas of 3D uh, printing. He's a professor of systems engineering at the University of um, Lagos. I'm sure um, he'll be able to introduce himself uh, uh, better when he takes the paper. So um, on to you, Professor. Thanks very much for, please, can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, thank, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm a lecturer at the University of Lagos. And uh, I've been here for a number of years. I also stu I studied there at the University of Lagos and some partly abroad. Now, what I'm to speak about today is uh, solid modeling, 3D printing, manufacturing as it relates to COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, I, because I have only five minutes, I decided to just make a brief statement on def defining terms and then tell you a little bit of what we have been doing. First of all, I can say, from my own point of view, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, COVID-19 is war. It's a war we are fighting because people are dying. People are, there are casualties in all sorts of ways. Uh, businesses are packing up. And uh, so many things are happening. People are displaced. And uh, many, many uh, things are happening that you only see in war. And again, this is worldwide. It's not only happening in local space. And if the predictions, we just hope, uh, hope to God that the predictions they are making about us do not come to pass, but they are saying we are still at the beginning, but I hope it will be proved false. But what is happening is that, I just thought about it. When last did we have a war in Nigeria? It was 50 years ago that the war ended in Nigeria. What happened at that war? We were running from pillar to post to find manufacturers to sell up to sell us weaponry to fight that war. Is it the Russians? Is it the British? Is it uh, America? Who will give us weapons to fight? We are killing ourselves there, but at least we still needed somebody to facilitate that. The question that comes to my mind is: in this war that is happening today, has anything fundamentally changed? Yes, we are talking about ICT. We are talking about uh, digital natives. We are talking about uh, what Google is doing, what uh, you can learn on the web. But what happens when you need hardware? You need, you need uh, something if, if, where, uh, now, before we were fighting. Now, suppose ICC shooting stars wants to go and fight a neighbor. Now, they are not fighting with uh, guns. They are fighting on the football field. Are they not likely to take a trip to Germany or to America to go and meet Nike and, uh, and Adidas to just get things as simple as the uniform they are going to wear to that field? To me, as uh, one of your, one uh, the, the keynote, the, the person who introduced us, sorry, I only know you as Bumi because uh, your name has been appearing as Bumi. He said we should attempt not to just make anything we do a simple talk shop. Now, if we are not going to do that, we are going to have metrics that are specific beyond the talk. What will happen to us if this COVID continues? And that has to do with our thinking as a nation. Are we going to be looking for manufacturers to sell us preventive care, protection equipment, testing and tracing? Acting now is existential because COVID-19 is actually a challenge to our technological development. The way any nation reacts to war is reflective of its technology. COVID-19 is a war. The way we will react to it is just talking about our technology. I just received, I'm going to receive a package of 50 face masks from the United States. Somebody has been campaigning that, ah, Nigeria is in trouble. We need to give them face masks. Somebody called me, ah, I said, oh, we know we are, you are in trouble, so we want to give you face mask. I felt insulted, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, disgrace the person who introduced me. I said, okay, please bring them. Now, failure to act means we become sick. Sadly, many will die. Let us talk about manufacturing technologies. People are talking of 3D printing. Manufacturing technologies is deeper than just what we are seeing on the surface. 
Modern manufacturing is done mostly on the computer where digital prototyping, testing by simulator leads to product as a service, pass. Just like you have now software as a service, you have product as a service because of the quick turnaround time of the design to the market. Software to do this is today available freely to students worldwide. And I'm telling you the amount of Peak, the, the amount that Nigeria is doing in the university system is very low. The amount of just tapping into that facility is very low. Relatively low power computers can be used as rip simulators and, and because simulations are done in the cloud on supercomputers. No matter how powerful your PC is, it's likely good, not powerful enough to do serious simulation. Non-linear and event simulations require supercomputers. But this barrier to entry has been obviated by cloud computing. There are companies today that are giving free cloud credits to everybody in any academic institution, whether it's primary, secondary, or university. Additive and subtractive manufacturing are vying for supremacy. If government is correctly advised, this is a unique opportunity to leapfrog into several steps in the development process, but we must be smart. We are not talking here about training uh, hobbyists, but we are talking about training experts and, and engineers. The essential ingredient is to link digital prototyping with the underlying science for innovation expertise. Modernizing the training of technicians is also important, but the strategy is different. I will now talk briefly about what we have been doing at the University of Lagos. I'll talk about S2P Africa, IDRC, and Unilag. We have some small funding from an international organization but initially, what we are trying to do is to turn the students we are teaching theory here to emphasizing to them that the reason why you are an engineer is that you can make something. If you are an engineer, you cannot make anything or you cannot cause anything to be made, then that's not engineering. I hope you are still hearing me because something is happening to my computer. Can you still hear me? Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Oh, okay. So what, did you lose me for some minutes? No. We oh, okay, sorry. Slightly. No, we didn't. Okay. We didn't okay, lose you. you. We just okay. put up your presentation so that you can have um, oh, your presentation oh. slides. Oh. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. I was just reading from my notes. Okay, thank you. You know precisely where I am. Our initial slide was to introduce funding level students to design by failure analysis. What we meant by that is that students will just look all over campus to look for anything that they think has failed, either a broken structure or a product. Then they make a solid model of that thing, predict the failure, simulate and optimize and redesign. We were doing that and COVID-19 struck. So what did we do next? We just moved what we were doing to producing PPEs to say, okay, look, uh, somebody sent us the Prusa fail sheet. Okay, let us do a parametric modeling of this. Uh, we did intubation boxes. And right now, there is a competitive design among four groups for uh, ventilator. And yesterday, we had a presentation on that, and uh, they are doing crash testing of that. These are students, student projects, so they graduate at 400 level. Now, we have had a lot of people say, oh, do 3D printing, do 3D printing. So we went ahead. Next slide, please went ahead and did some analysis of uh, 3D printing because uh, the, the things you saw on that last slide were 3D printed. We were able to see that if you are going to take a thousand copies of an, of, uh, an object, something as simple as a face shield, if you 3D print it by our own estimation of costs, you are going to spend about a, a thousand naira to get a unit of that of that uh, face shield holder. If, but if you go to injection molding, there are companies in Lagos that are doing injection molding. If you give that your mold, if you can get a dye to an injection molder, the thing can be made for as low as 90 Naira or as high as 300 Naira, depending on how much they charge you for the dye or how you can make the dye. But if you can give them the dye, that whole thing will not cost you more than 90 Naira. So when people are talking to us from abroad and say, to do 3D printing, we say, no. We know about 3D printing. 3D printing is good for prototyping. But when it comes to making things in quantity, that is not the way to go. 
additive manufacturing is there, but we need to know what its limitations are in order for us to take the proper advantage of it. Next slide, please. Now, since the COVID outbreak, our students have been challenged to respond. And like I said, presentation on impact and crack design took place on Zoom yesterday. Student public presentation will take place early June. Ventilator unit costs by their own uh, estimates cost, will cost between 40,000 to 80,000 Naira, which is a fraction of what you would do if you have to import these things. And these projects are partially funded. We have, we have a small desktop CNC machine to call the Visor casing and the prospects, while some parts will be 3D printed, others will be purchased. Electronics is being done by single onboard computers. These are mechanical and systems engineering students. Now, we are giving them this challenge. And, uh, but we found out that so many Nigerians are claiming to have made things. And we are not seeing an organized response to this. What is the response? OK, if I tell you that I can make a helicopter and I put a fan on top of, a beetle, on top of an old beetle, and I get it to rotate, and some press men come after me and say, oh, this man is a genius. He has made a helicopter. And we leave that story there. Nigeria has been doing that for many, many years. What I'm so challenging us to do, not just government, I mean rich Nigerians, organizations, government, we should stake money on design, on design challenges. If somebody says we have made something, why can't we pay for like 10 copies of what he has paid, or what he, say, what he claims to have made? And let us stress test that thing and see whether it is useful or not. And then if it's not useful, if it's just fake, then we put a stop to that and stop disturbing our people with all sorts of fictitious claims. Because with all the claims we have been making in the past 50 years, we are still the people that somebody will send a pack of 50 face masks to and say, well, we know you people are suffering. When we have tailors here, and it's all we need to do is to get the N N90 uh, um, uh, element and give it to them to sew, to sew up. Now, the other thing is that, OK, so if we can do that, pay for a number that will be duly tested and scaled up for full manufacturing, or we know that this thing is not useful and we stop the talk. Upstream issues. There, are ten, there, there was it when I was counting the number of secondary schools like uh, 20 years ago. I'm sure the data should have drastically changed now. There are at that time 10,000 government. There are 10,000 schools, not only government, in Nigeria. Maybe there are 20,000 now. I don't know. There is no reason why this cannot be equipped with solid model labs and modeling software. COVID has taught us to know that the idea that somebody is so far away and cannot be taught is false. Now we are we have this meeting today is distributed. Primary schools in Lagos here have been teaching by Zoom since the beginning of this COVID. There should be a way using the ICT uh, development we are talking about to be able to teach them by remote, even if there are no experts on ground in that place. We just need to organize it and make sure that they pay some of the money so that they will consider the thing is important. Now. We, we, we are planning a design competition and we are looking for $200,000. It's a, a regional design competition. But we just found that we can now do it for $10,000. And most of the money we already have, and they will all go, they will essentially go to uh, giving prizes. So what we are saying here is that let us have data. Let us have an action plan. Let us do specific things to know that now we had a war 50 years ago. A war is happening today. If the attitude to uh, equipment ourselves for the war is not much different from what happened 50 years ago. What do we do today to make sure that if there's another war, 50 years time, which will be 100 years after the first war, that Nigeria will be ready? I want us to see what we can do beyond uh, these top shops. Next slide, please. That's my last slide. I hope something good will happen as a result of uh, COVID-19. The first point I'm making here shouldn't be made any longer because virtually everybody that has spoken here today, they have implied this. The era of importation as a first line of action, as our impulse, as our instinct, has to be jettisoned. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not only rice that Nigeria is capable, it's uh, always important. We are important if all of us that are sitting here, listening here, let us begin to touch our hat, our glasses, our headphone, our tie, 
our wristwatch, our shoe, everything. There is still, no matter what we are saying about all these other things, the fact that we are still so dependent on small, small, simple things that the people making those things from overseas, they are asking, is there nobody in that place? And it is not that there are nobodies, but somehow we have a system that does not allow these things to just work there. So we have to really uh, work on that. Because the traditional sources of our importation are deploying their own capacity to the survival of their own people. And even the money we are dependent on, like the oil money, at least I know that COVID has done some terrible things to that one also. Even if we are going to import, because, yes, this is my last slide. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, even if we are going to import, we should not be importing finished finish products. We should add value. Manufacturing is value addition. You are a manufacturer whenever you add a value. Nobody, no company on earth makes everything complete anymore. They simply add value. Nigerians too can be taught to add value. That's where I rest my case. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Professor Omotayo Fakinlede, for that very insightful presentation. Um, it is important for us to begin to look inward and organize the local capacity to create and think ourselves through this very difficult situation. Um, we're honored to have you and to recognize some of the work that it's currently been, um, um, that your team is working on. Um, the summary of all of that is um, we need to begin to look inward. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm sure the presentation slide or the text will be made available to all the participants in this um, um, webinar. Um, without further ado, um, we must apologize to the panel plenary uh, session two. Um, we thank you for your patience. Um, we've um, taken a bit longer than um, we were um, supposed to take. So we will go um, right into the. We will go right into the. We will go right into the second plenary. So um, we will introduce our panelists first before diving into the topic of the day. We have Professor Umar Dambata who is the Executive Vice Chairman of the Nigerian Communications Commission. Um, he's been with us from the very start. Thank you very much, sir, for um, coming in. One of the first people to join the conference and, and you've been here. It's our honor to have you sit down and talk about this. Um, we have Omowale David Ashiru, who is the Vice President um, Global Operations at Andela, one of our local success stories. Um, some people say Andela is no longer a local company, but we have to claim uh, Andela. Thank you very much for being here. Um, also, we have Akin Oyebode, who is the special advisor to the governor of Ekiti State, and who also happens to be the chairman of the Nigerian uh, Governor's um, Forum is here with us. Um, it's a star-studded second plenary. We have um, Baba Family, sorry, Baba Femi Ohung Bamola. I hope I didn't uh, do injustice to your name. He's the Chief Information Officer for the InterSwitch Group, representing uh, Mitchell Alegbe, who had a, a competing um, 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 schedule. Thank you. It's an honor to have you here. Um, lastly, and not the least, we have uh, Bumi Akiyemi, who is the um, facilitator for the Digital Economy Policy Commission and is also um, um, in the capacity of the CEO Venture Guarding Group um, that has a, quite a number of um, um, business, technology business interests. Um, it's an honor to have you here for me and every other person. So we will go directly into the topic for today. And as we, and as we discuss, the, each of the panelists will take um, roughly 
about two two minutes or three minutes to do a brief introduction and to set the tone for the I'll contest. <laughs> we will be talking in this second section um, about how Nigerian companies can take advantage of the proposed local content bill to develop. Um, um, okay, sorry, I'm reading the I'm reading from uh, something else. I'm sorry. Um, we want to talk about local content in this second plenary session, and um, it is critical for us to look at how to merge local content innovation and entrepreneurship to achieve results for the Nigerian digital economy. So to discuss this, we have um, the representation from Funke Okweke, Professor Madame Bata, Mowale David Ashiru, to talk um, about this. So we'll kick this session off um, um, first by uh, the Executive Vice Chairman of the NCC, so in two minutes, please give us a, a, a self-introduction and also the context for the second plenary session. Professor, you have the floor, sir. OK, can you hear me? Better? Yes, we can. Well, thank you very much for uh allowing me to participate in this uh, very, very important engagement um, under the auspices of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. I'm delighted you know, to participate um, in the seminar. And uh, although a different topic was communicated to me to speak on, for which I prepared some slides, but I can comfortably speak on the slightly modified topic, which, which revolves around content, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I think um, these are very, very challenging times for us, uh, times that demand and challenge us to look inwards and come up with initiatives that will enable us contain and contend with the challenges you know, facing this country. And an important area we can do that is in the area of content development, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Trust me, but the Nigerians are highly innovative and highly enterprising citizens. And I strongly believe in this ability that we have in our use what it takes to make a lot of difference post um, COVID pandemic. When we talk about how to drive local content, how to promote innovations and entrepreneurship, we must first of all address one fundamental um, issue confronting this country. These three things are not going to be driven just like that. Initial work will be required to put necessary things in place. And one of the necessary things you know, we need to do is to ensure we have the infrastructure that can host innovation, local content, and entrepreneurship. And today we have come to believe and accept that the telecommunications network is no longer a means of mere connectivity. It has become an important source of data-driven innovation that can add, that has the potential to add value to businesses, in society. This, this is an acceptable and undisputable fact. And as such, because of the sheer nature of the broadband network that we're talking about here, a network that lends itself to driving interactions of huge volumes at the right speed. To me, that is the work we need to first of all, put in place. And to put this quickly 
uh, within the shortest possible time. We must address the infrastructure deficiency that is manifest in this country. And I think as we are conducting this important you know, seminar, we've seen challenges of connectivity. Although I must commend you know, the, the resilience of the network. So far, these disruptions you know, to this engagement, you know, I can count the number of times you know, they, they, you know, they have happened. You know, that is to the credit of this government, um, the, the, the federal government of Nigeria, as well as to the ministry, the supervisor minister of the telecommunications you know, sector of the economy, as well as to some extent, the telecommunications regulator. It shows you what efforts we are making to ensure that the infrastructure that is needed, especially at this time of the pandemic, is an infrastructure that can be able to contend and cope with the deluge of data services that we are seeing. And I have a point to make here that when we look at the recent statistics, of broadband services across the 3G and 4G networks. We discovered all the subscriptions are on the 4G. You know, I, as you are aware, but the 4G is, you know, the data, it is the network of, you know, data services. It's the, it, it's the network that is driving data services all over the world. And we have seen a slight reduction of 3G services across all the mobile network operators for the first time you know, in the history of the NCC. This is unbelievable, but it's not unexpected. Now, this is pointing to the fact that people are increasingly using data services, and therefore something needs to be done very fast to ensure that these data services are not only available, but they are affordable and accessible. And that is why I would like to refresh our memories to the huge data capacity that we have at the landing point in Lagos. People talk about 20 terabytes of data, some say 16, okay. but whatever is the figure. I know and I believe that from the undersea cables of main one, to glow one, to wax, that is the West African submarine cable, to even the oldest undersea cable, that is the SAT-3 cable. I know we have a combined capacity that is not reaching the hinterland. And until and unless we can move this capacity to the hinterland, until and unless we put the network that will host this massive capacity, move it into the hinterland to every nook and cranny of this country, we will not be able to have the right kind of data prices. There will be no affordability in data services. And I think an important statement has been made by the Honorable Minister when he cited as one of the pillars of the digital economy strategy roadmap, when he cited solid infrastructure. Solid infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen, refers to infrastructure, you know, that is either fiber, I'm talking here about mobile infrastructure that is either fixed, fiber, or wireless. Most of us are associated with the wireless infrastructure, which is about 55 to 60%, you know, which accounts for about 50, to 60% of the total you know, broadband network in this country. The fiber infrastructure, that is the fixed infrastructure, is one that we can not write home about because we have a little under 40,000 kilometers of this fixed you know, infrastructure. And what we need in this country is 120,000 kilometers of fiber infrastructure. I'm not saying this up here. This is captured in the next level document of the federal government, an important policy pronouncement made by this government. 
So how do we therefore raise the level of deployment of fixed infrastructure reasonably from where we are, about 47 kilometers of fiber, to at, to at least 60 or maybe even 80 thousand kilometers of fiber. And therefore, a plan is needed, one is in place. And what the NCC did was to grant infrastructure licenses to six infrastructure companies. The country was divided into seven zones. The, 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 the zones are, are, are the ones, the, the geopolitical zones that we all know. And then Lagos was carved as a zone on its own because of the strategic commercial importance of Lagos. So we have a total of seven zones. And the infrastructure plan envisages deployment of infrastructure in all these seven zones with a provision of point of broadband access in every local government area in the country. So there's going to be a point of broadband access in all the 774 local governments with a capacity of 10 gigabits. Okay. Uh, Prof, thank you. I I um, I want you to save some of the very very interesting things where you're sharing when we get into the plenary session, so that we just have opening remarks and then we can jump into the conversation. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, with the humble permission of the facilitator, um, we and, and also based on um, the people who are present. Um, um, on this uh, plenary, we have extended our conversation into broadband. So uh, the initial presentations that captured broadband because of the tone that the executive vice chairman has actually set for us, we cannot escape from broadband in our conversation. So thank you very much, sir. And um, next, let's hear from o Omowale um, um, David Ashiru, who is the Vice President of Global Operations, Antela. Let's have your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, Mic check, can you all hear me? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and I stand on all existing protocol. Um, so yes, just like um, um, the EVC said, the topic is slightly different from you know, uh, what I wanna talk about, but you said something about local content, which is really important. I think the greatest local content that we have in this nation is our people. Everything we're talking about, digitization, infrastructure, all of that um, still runs on our people. And so that's, so in terms of reskilling, upskilling talent for the future, that's something that we need to critically look at. And I know that um, Jan Dace, spoke about that. So a lot has been said about impact, opportunities, and action already being taken. Um, over the years, we've spoken about the future of work being digital. I think for me, the major impact of COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminder that the future is digital, remote, and distributed. But that future is now. And um, we have all the statistics. Over the past month, the use of Zoom, which we're using now, has more than doubled went from 10 million daily active users to over 200 million in three months. Same thing with internet usage increased by 70% and 12% globally in, the, in this um, time of the pandemic. But I think the one that's really dear to my heart because um, at Andela we've been at the forefront of this is remote working or remote flexibility. Organizations are employing remote and virtual work strategies. People have been doing this in the past, but what COVID-19 did and the way people have described it was threw us or forced us into a worldwide experiment of remote work. We literally had no choice. And what's happening is that companies, um, CEOs, people are now realizing, you know what? There's efficiency in this. There's optimization in this. There's globalization in this. We can do this. Um, and I know one speaker was mentioned in, uh, I think the right honorable, many companies now have come fully remote, Twitter, Facebook, um, Amazon, and even Andela were fully remote in seven locations worldwide. So remote work is something that I see that we're, really need, we're going to need to look into and invest in. And I'm tying this to talent. Given the example of Andela, you know, we have brilliant people in Nigeria. Everyone has said that. I'm not going to rehash that. We have brilliant people, brilliant engineers. 
And I'm um, using our Lagos office as an example. You know, we started and we were trying to connect talent in Nigeria to opportunity all over the world, you know, tech companies all over the world. And we did that successfully. But we had limitations because we had all these brilliant engineers and they had to come and work in our facilities in Lagos, which meant that brilliant engineers in Abuja, in Kaduna, and all those places who wanted to work with Angela but were not willing to relocate, were not able to take advantage of that. When we started off in Egypt and we started fully remote in less than, I think, five months, we grew exponentially because we had people from all over, talent from different cities, able to connect with opportunity worldwide remotely. And so remote, um, I think the, the other important thing I will mention about remote work is, you know, remote work isn't just about working from home or working from your bed. I know that's what a lot of people think about. Remote work actually has processes, tools, and workflows that make remote work work. And so we need to invest in that. We need to learn about that. We need to upskill and reskill our talent to be able to do that. Remote work will open up opportunities. I think Juliet spoke about business process outsourcing. That's like a $400 billion you know, industry. Um, South Africa was able to increase their um, growth in that sector by 22% year on year. But BPO, business process outsourcing and remote work, all of this is a 24 7 365 thing that cannot cannot be done without any without glitches or can must be done without glitches which leads me to infrastructure everyone has spoken about infrastructure i think the quick thing i wanted to say is um we all talk about the government yes the government has a role to play but the government um doesn't necessarily have the expertise so that partnership is really really key we've been talking about it i think of course we need to go beyond talk like Bumi said and act and in looking at the government, I also like to say, let's not just talk about the federal government. There are a lot of things that can be executed at the state level. Um, I think it was AKT State recently that has just, and they're doing something really good, talked about broadband, just like um, the EVC talked about, and um, trying to lay cable 600 kilometers, which will move their internet usage from 16% to 90%. You know, So state level partnership is really, really key. The right honorable talked about driving three hours to, um, to attend this webinar. And he's right, that underscores the importance of this webinar. But I think I'd also like to add that that underscores the importance of us fixing infrastructure and doing it now. So a lot of talk, but um, I think what we, we know what to do, we're brilliant. I think it's now time to just act. Thank you very much, um, Omowale. You said so much within a very short space of time, and I'm gonna pick you up on a couple of those things you mentioned, and you said you didn't prepare your presentation well, but I think um, you've actually helped us set the tone very, very well. Um, I would, you kind of like played into the next speaker, um, who is uh, Akin Oyebode, a special advisor to the um, uh, state of, of governor and also the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Conference. Um, Akin, Tell us about your experience in Equity. Why is your experience such an important one for us to, you know, learn from? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think to frame the conversation, we've there, there are a lot of good things I hear. So we're talking about, you know, attacking or tapping into a large uh, BPO market globally. We're talking about infrastructure. Um, we are going to talk about things like education and just developing the right talent pool. Uh, but I think that one of the, I'll say, potential opportunities from the pandemic, as has been clearly highlighted, is remote working. Um, in AKT, we, we've identified the knowledge economy as uh, an area where we have a comparative advantage. Uh, primarily because we have a young, very literate uh, population. Um, but we also recognize that we had some constraints, uh, one of which was infrastructure. So as you drive through or drive to a kitty from Lagos, uh, you, start, you start in Lagos at 4G. Uh, once you get past the Badon, uh, then you get to 3G. Uh, once you get past Oshun, you take whatever you get um, until you get to Adu Ekiti again, where the connectivity starts to pick up. So it tells you that people can't live in what you might call suburban or even rural communities and benefit from some of these opportunities. So the goal, I, I believe, from speaking as the government, uh, as one of the government representatives on the, on the panel, 
the goal is to democratize opportunity. Um, and it, you shouldn't be locked out uh, or excluded from opportunity based on where you live. Uh, and so our goal is to say, look, how do we encourage infrastructure providers um, to lay that infrastructure in a place that doesn't have obvious commercial viability? Uh, my view and my, my, my hypothesis is that non-consumption is actually the biggest factor here. Uh, people are not consuming telecommunication services simply because it's not available in their locations. Uh, people won't buy uh, smartphones, even if they can afford it. They won't buy smartphones in these communities because it makes no difference whether they work with a smartphone or a feature phone. Um, and so we think that if we look at where telecoms is today, it's 14% of the country's GDP. It's one of the few growth poles in a fairly difficult Q1, uh, Q1 period. And it potentially might even be the only one left uh, when the Q2 numbers come out. So our, our view in AKT is to uh, anchor economic development around the service economy. Things like business process outsourcing, for example, is a big area that we want to tap into in the States. Um, things like software development, software engineering skills are skills that we want to build uh, within, within the States. And it's to harness some of the talent pool we've seen we've seen locally. I, I mean, I always use an example from my previous job at the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund. Uh, we had a company called Tech Experts uh, look at Lagos as a potential uh, hub for their customer service work. And their biggest issue was, can we find the talent in Lagos? And I laughed. Um, they came in here looking to hire 100 people. They ended up having about 3,000 CVs. Half of those were very competent people. So they started out with 300 people. Today, I learned they are now at 1,200 employees in Lagos only, you know, within two years of coming in here. And that tells you the opportunity that exists if we lay the right infrastructure, if we support this with the right policies, if we truly improve um, the ease of doing business, not just as a country, but even independently as subnationals. And if we start to collaborate even along regional, regional uh, hubs. So I, I think for me, um, the guys like Andela, for example, have shown what can happen um, if you support if you support talent properly. Some of the work that Google, Microsoft, etc., are doing tells you that Nigeria is a is a very attractive market to to global players. I think from our side, it's now to say how do we ramp up um, on the infrastructure side? How do we continue to improve? And it's not just policy in the ICT domain. It's actually even things like the curriculum. How do we um, emphasize some of these digital skills as part of the early stage learning uh, experience? So those are the kind of uh, conversations and policy articulation that I, that I hope that we can drive within the next couple of years. I, I'll stop here for now and take more specific uh, comments later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aki. Um, you put it very, very nicely. Investment in infrastructure leads to corresponding growth in the local capacities and local content. Business process outsourcing is something um, EKT is um, currently looking, um, um, looking at, and um, you are in good company. We have also in the call um, representative of... Uh, the Chief Executive Officer for the InterSwitch Group, Michal Alekbe, in the person of Baba Femi Ogungbamola. Thank you very much. We're honored to have you make this meeting. So do like uh, your opening remarks. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I hope everybody can hear me. Yes. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, I stand on the existing protocol. Uh, my name is Baba Femi Ogungbamola, uh, just to be clear. <laughs> Um, I, I think I'm also, uh, I'd like to um, say that uh, the GMB is uh, unavoidably absent and, and he sends his apologies. Uh, I think for me, it's, a, it's an honor to uh, actually be part of this uh, discussion as well. So I think quite excited what's going on. And just to quickly start, um, uh, COVID, as much as a challenge, I think uh, one of the biggest things that I've seen and one of the biggest um, uh, things that I've learned from, from, from this scenario is the fact that they're actually presenting us a very, very good opportunity, a very big, big opportunity that we've seen within our enterprise. And then I think Nigeria as a, as a, as a country can actually tap into as well. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to talk about is to say, I mean, what is the, what is the goal 
of all this? What what why are we trying to you know drive the digital economy? Why are we trying? What what, what is it? What is that driving us? I think what is driving us really, uh, from my perspective, is is to create prosperity within within Nigeria. All right, is 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 to create prosperity. Is to is to use that to move people out of poverty, drive and drive the economy. And then for this to happen, we need to create jobs. All right, we need to, we need people to have jobs, we need to earn a living. And to create jobs, we need, uh, and not just any kind of job, we need local jobs, not the global jobs that can easily be uh, transferred out of the country. The jobs are really, that are really serving the economy, they're serving the people locally here that really can, that can be transferred, all right? And to create those kind of jobs, what you need is innovation and entrepreneurship, which this uh, you know, uh, panel session is supposed to talk, talk about. And the innovation has to be specific. The kind of innovation that addresses critical services, necessities, not just not things that are, you know, things that would address um, uh, people that typically will not consume, like uh, like uh, Akin mentioned. It's it's, it's the non-consumption that I'm trying to address. A lot of people out there need to put services in their hands that they typically need, but then they cannot cannot afford. And that's where innovation that can drive um, this prosperity will, will, will come will come from. And how does this happen? What are the steps that we need to take? And I think the first thing is to recognize that the government in this scenario should actually should, should play the role of a catalyst. Okay. And how does the government do that? Uh, I think the first thing is, and I think taking from the, um, the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy documents, the first thing, one of the things that I, that I like about that strategy is the fact that they actually lays out a couple of, about eight pillars. The one that I think is probably most important in this today is around the solid infrastructure that the um, Vice Chairman NC mentioned earlier, and which is essentially uh, the infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure. We need to get that to as many people as possible. We need to get that to as many countries of the country as possible so that everybody can actually um, you know, benefit and tap into those services. Because if that doesn't happen, really, no matter what we do, we don't get the critical mass that we need to grow uh, the economy like, like, like we would. So that, that's very, very important. The next pillar that I think is uh, probably the most important is, um, is the service infrastructure where the government itself, right, is becoming more and more digital. And the more government becomes digital, the more enterprises, entrepreneurs that can be, would come up to serve that government that is digital. The more government is digital, the more people that will require training that they actually need, all right, that they can pull the training that they need to become digital natives like we want everybody to be. All right, so it kind of creates a, a flywheel effect, whereby as you begin to address things from that core um, requirement, then, then the system itself, the economy itself just on its own begins to bloom and, and move very, very, very quickly. So, I mean, let me just, I mean, stop with that. Uh, there, there's a lot of room to talk about a few more things uh, as we go on uh, in the session. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Baba Femi. I appreciate your perspective with respect to the pillars of the digital economy. We're gonna go straight into questions. And Bumi, I want you to help us um, set the tone for this. Within the last um, six weeks, everybody now knows um, Zoom. We uh, did, Do you think as a country, we did enough to leverage existing technology? Because I'll tell you something that I watched on TV. Um, in terms of education, um, kids have been at home now for about three months. And um, government actually said the kids should not, the, uh, the schools should not begin their e-learning. Um, 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 so a lot of parents had to homeschool their children. But I watched something on the TV recently where in Peru, they did this training for, um, and they were teaching people all through the day using television. And in Uganda, they use uh, radio. Have we done enough in terms of harnessing the local capacities to be able to solve some of these problems in Nigeria? But we said, take that up. Yes, thanks, uh, Chris. I, I, and I don't think we have done enough to uh, harness local capabilities. Uh, and there are probably many reasons for that, right? Number one, I think we tend to have that inferiority complex that anything that was like designed and created in Nigeria by Nigerians, it just can't be as good as, you know, 
what is made in America, right? And, and I think that's a rhetoric that needs to um, change because we're actually seeing a lot of local innovation that is playing globally. I mean, InterSwitch is a very, very good example of that, right? How many card schemes are there in Africa? InterSwitch has the Verve card scheme, just like Union, Pay, or Visa, or MasterCard. So that's a good example of local innovation. Now, how many um, uh, virtual you know, learning systems are in Nigeria? I bet you there's probably 20 or 50, right? And I bet you there's probably five or 10 that are really, really good. The question is, can they have access to capital, right? Um, do they have access to the right infrastructure? We've been talking about infrastructure you know, earlier, right? And do they have the right talent, which the first panel you know, was all about? So for me, I think it's a case where, you know, and I think China is a perfect example. China is a perfect example of local content, right? They made a decision you know, um, that this, we're gonna take this seriously. And then the collaboration happened between private sector and public sector, and then they went hard at it. I think there's a perfect opportunity for Nigeria to do the same thing, saying we have the potential. Well, let's move from potential to actualizing it, right? So we could argue as well that some of the talent, uh, some of the Nigerian talent are not in Nigeria, they're in the diaspora, and that's fine. Thank God for Zoom. Jump on Zoom, get them on, collaborate, and leverage the global you know, uh, uh, capacity you know, and talent of Nigerians all over the world, leverage the local and global capacity of financing and funding. And for me, when we talk about infrastructure and everything and innovation, it comes down to financing for me. I think that's a very important conversation to have. And it's not that the financing is not happening, but if 100%, 95% of the financing is coming from America, coming from China, where do you think the IP is going to reside? it's not going to be Nigeria. It's going to be incorporate your company in Mauritius, incorporate your company in Delaware, right? And so all of a sudden the tax benefits and the prosperity that, you know, Baba Femi was talking about is not going to re reside here. So I think it's high time that we take a look and be proactive around all of these different dimensions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bumi. I think I missed uh, Kazim Oladipo. Kazim Oladipo is the regional executive representing Funke Opeke of Maine One. Uh, I'm sorry, Kazim, your video is not showing. So I think I missed your, I missed your opening remarks. We could have that now. Thank you, Kazim. Unmute your unmute your call. Yeah, I just did. Yeah, sorry. I uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think I was actually uh, enjoying the conversation. I, I didn't actually realize that you had uh, missed me. I am actually sending uh, Mr. Quickes um, apologies for not being on the call. She needed to be somewhere uh, that came urgently out of schedule. Um, well, I think. Most of the speakers have spoken uh, significantly into uh, what I believe the key uh, discourse is about. Um, and I think the last speaker in particular brought uh, uh, another dimension into it, talking through uh, funding uh, when you talk about infrastructure and when you talk about innovation. Um, I believe that as the EBC said, uh, the biggest impediment today, I think we've all been witnesses to it in the last uh, two and a half months, uh, where uh, work not from home, but work from everywhere or anywhere has become the new normal or will become uh, the new normal going forward. And uh, it is becoming uh, imperative that we need to have the critical infrastructure that uh, we need to have the critical infrastructure that supports uh, the ability to work uh, from everywhere and also to innovate and drive some of the critical uh, contents, some of the critical uh, requirements that will grow the digital economy and fulfill 
uh, the aspirations that government has uh, for growing the overall economic space. Um, however, um, infrastructure comes uh, only when there's uh, motivation for it. Um, and that motivation is, I, I believe, driven by entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is driven by innovation. Um, but innovation would not thrive without funding uh, and funding would not thrive without creating the right local uh, operating uh, conducive environment for it. So uh, it, it's a combination of all of these things and some more that allows uh, the country to achieve those digital objectives. I, I thought we would talk about the national broadband plan. Uh, the EVC has spoken to what the NCC has done. There had been a plan between 2013 and 18, which has been replaced now by the 2020 to 2025 plan. But again, when you look at the uh, critical components of that plan is sitting around policy, uh, which would drive competitiveness and create the conducive enabling environment. It's talking about the infrastructure, which you would have if you, if you have the right policy. And of course, talks about incentives, uh, which is a combination of relaxing some rules about costs. Uh, I can talk about right of way and what the Kitty State is doing and also create in the right framework for people to bring in the requisite FBI, uh, which is about investment uh, from wherever that investment is coming from, local and international. Absolutely. And uh, of course, the last thing, I think one of the speakers also spoken to that, is driving the demand side of uh, the digital economy and broadband penetration, which is where you need to stimulate content, uh, where you need to create uh, somebody talked about public sector services being online, uh, which Absolutely. drives more public utilization of those services, which drives the critical mass that investors or entrepreneurs or innovators need to make a business case for uh, whatever content or uh, creations that they're putting in the market okay. to drive the growth. So that right. I'll leave it there for now. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kazim. Um, I appreciate your breaking that down because I know. Um, your CEO actually worked and chaired the committee that uh, led that uh, broadband, Nigerian broadband plan. My next question actually goes to the EVC. Um, we all know about the new Nigerian broadband plan 2020 to 2025. I also hear about the point of presence that is being driven across 774 local government areas. These are all laudable achievements and um, laudable strategies. But what specifically is the NCC and other regulatory arms of government doing to create opportunities for the local businesses in the digital economy, leveraging on this uh, national broadband plan? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to apologize by referring to you as uh, Bode. I know you will accept my apology. Absolutely. Um, you see, um, what we are seeing, very, very encouraging developments um, in this commitment by government through the NCC to deploy broadband infrastructure, you know, across, you know, the country is the waving away of the right of way by some state governments. Some uh, have reduced it to the harmonized rate of 145 uh, Naira for linear meter lengths of um, fiber. Some have altogether removed it. And I can cite states you know, like Kaduna, um, as well as Ekiti. These are states who have really said, no, you know, we're, we're not going to charge anything except for the cost of reinstatement, you know, where infrastructure service providers, you know, break roads, you know, it's still, it is expected of them to reinstate and make those, you know, portions, you know, of the road, you know, good. But there are also states who say, we will not charge more than the specified amount in the National Economic Council document, which is 145 uh, Naira of um, per, per, per linear meter lens of uh, fiber. 
And these states are, I think, Kasina and Imo. And we would like to see more states emulate the good examples, you know, set by their excellencies, the four, the four, you know, executive governors, you know, I've just, whose states, you know, I cited. Now, when you talk about opportunities, it is when the infrastructure gets, you know, to all those areas, you know, we're talking about, you know, areas that we call beyond, we would like to classify them as beyond, you know, the frontiers of economic viability, where, where, you know, you provide these services, not because you are going to, you know, make any profit, but because you want to stimulate social and economic development in those, you know, in, in those areas. Now, it is when this infrastructure is deployed in those areas through a deliberate government policy that we will see local content development coming up, that we will see local applications that are disruptive, that, you know, we will see entrepreneurship, okay? The, the list is endless. You know, we will see the ability to do many things, the ability to give the best possible, you know, quality education to our children, even to generations yet unborn, the ability to manage better the environment we are living in, the ability to control and use energy more efficiently. You know, we don't have enough energy. How do we manage energy? Yeah. The ability to how do we how do we manage and provide services to poor and isolated populations? Banking services, financial services. You know, how do we extend these financial services to communities without any banks? Okay, so you you, you can see how all of a sudden the social economic ecosystem is going to change how people in rural communities will be empowered to come up with all kinds of incentives, changing the ways you know, they are doing things, adding value in the process you know, to the way they are doing those things and by so doing, improving their productivity. Now, I had briefly, Chris, please allow me for just a minute. <laughs> we, we have this PPP. We, we are officially out of time, but I would allow you to round up in one minute. Just round it up in one minute, and then the, we can. The best model for any infrastructure deployment in any country is one that is private public partnership driven. So, in this, the government of this country is involved, is, is, is a critical stakeholder, and the, the, the private sector is also going to be there. Okay, so it is through this model, a model that is recommended by the International Telecommunications Union that we are trying to ensure this deployment takes place and in a timely manner. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, EVC. So um, technically you're saying your doors are open to public-private partnerships and conversations leading to the formation of a standing platform that allows the NCC to crowdsource information from the private sector. All okay. right. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to look a bit more into, and I will give us the opportunity, I don't know if we'll be able to bring in some questions, but there was something Omowale um, um, said in her opening remarks that struck me. Work is digital, it is remote, and it is distributed. My thinking now is, how do we ensure, because a lot of the talent that is being, um, um, that Andela has actually worked, uh, they're being outsourced globally. Now we are having such conversations to look more inward. So what can Andela typically do, or what do you think that needs to be done by other companies like Andela to be able to look more inward to get this talent after training them to um, um, you know spend more time developing the local economy rather than jetting off in the next opportunity that is available all right um, thank you um, so i think the obvious one is definitely no one company can do this so the power of collaboration 
even in skilling and in uh, you know training, Andela hasn't done that on its own. So we've done things like the ALC, where you've we partnered with companies like Google, Facebook, Plural Site to be able to develop and train software developers. I know Juliet spoke about this, but each company had a different role. We had the same goal. We need our people to be digitally you know, trained to become software engineers. Someone provided the platform, someone provided the funding, someone provided the, you know, the remote skills and they were able to do that. So a lot of collaboration is required across board. I've talked about federal, state, legislative, private, collaboration, kind of like what we're doing, but maybe beyond the talk. And I really like what we said about, you know, setting up a structure where you have KPIs, where you are coming back to see what has been achieved and you're measuring things. So that collaboration is needed. Then investment, um, this is not an Andela thing, but we have people that are actually doing things and are trying to do things in this, you know, country. Um, we have a lot of tech companies. We have Decagon that's trying to, you know, um, raise talent. We have um, CC Hub started in Yaba. I mean, Yaba is our own, was our own Silicon Valley and it wasn't started by the government. It was by young men and women, you know, doing things. Now, CC Hub has moved to Rwanda, South Africa, I don't know where else, you know, but we need um, to invest in such. That's the only way such companies, such entrepreneurs can continue to grow, not just externally, but even within Nigeria, you know, and, um, you know, provide jobs and all of the things that we need internally. So collaboration, investment, deliberate and intentional investment in such things. Um, thank you very much, Amawali, for shedding light on that. It is um, going to be achieved by collaboration between companies coming together, not just one company, but identifying a central coordination and control by setting up um, a project management or portfolio management office with KPIs, action plans, and targets. I, we are seriously pressed for time. And what um, we have a couple of questions. At this point, we want to try to bring in people from the audience. And we have a couple of questions. So I'm going to read out um, the questions um, um, that we have from the audience. I will read everything in, a, in its entirety. And in our rounding up, and um, oh, you can answer the question and then round up your talk so that we can bring this um, um, plenary to a close. So I'll read out the questions and make suggestions as to who will answer those questions. When I, um, okay, the first one is from Nuhu Yakubu. He says, we are aware of, we are aware of the digitization of Nigeria and we must consider the strength of the network to allow for streaming services. What is the Niger What is the status of the Nigerian government on 5G installation? That question I think can only be done justice to by the EVC. So um, I, would, I, would, I would say, hold on on that question. Let me read through everything so that we use it to, to close. The next question from Abiola Ewola is, is there currently financial provisions by the private sector or the government to help emerging startups? She took the question right out of my mouth. Um, what are the um, um, strategies or the provisions by either the organized private sector or the government to help um, um, innovation startups? Bumi can help us use this to um, shed more light on, on this since we don't have any other government panelists here. Amaka Ibeji says, um, okay, she just requires the link to the Honorable Lagos Bill. I'm sure that will be provided in the subsequent follow-up notes. If your information is there, you will get this information. Ayodele Untoglu says, this question goes to Professor Dambata specifically. He mentioned granting infrastructure development capacity to companies. Are there current opportunities for people or Nigerians with internetworking skills? Um, that is from Ayodele. Um, Chris Waje again um, poses a question. How do we deal with the technology disconnect between government industry and academia? Um, I would say, okay, this is a question that Bumi can help us um, answer. 
and then all the other speakers can give us their um, closing remarks um, after. So we'll just speak in turn. Please, let's try to keep this within a two minute um, within a two minute timeline so that we can bring this section of the plenary to a close. We'll start with Professor Uma Dambata. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. I will go straight uh, to the question by Nuhu Yakubu. The status of 5G in this country is as follows. One, a trial had uh, taken place in six locations in this country. And the results of the trial tests have been conveyed to government with a recommendation. Um, I don't want to preempt what the government intends to do with that in a recommendation, okay? So we have very much tested in, in a trial manner, the 5G technology, all the beautiful things, you know, they're talking about 5G, they are true, speed, capacity, you know, um, ability to connect so many people, enhance, broadband you know services all these are true but there are risks associated and i think uh this has been pointed out some of these are security risks and government i believe is studying the report and uh, will come up with a statement you know on the way forward that much i can see esco licenses not just infrastructure licenses you know the commission gives all all kinds of licenses in order to ensure the vibrancy of the telecommunication sector is sustained. So if uh, out there, there are people interested in a particular license, please and please and please, you don't even have to come physically to the commission, you know, embrace this virtuality. You know, we are very, very visible. You know, visit our website at ng.gov, you know, at uh, ng, ng.gov.ng and access, you know, the licensing documents of the type, you know, that you want, and this will be processed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Umar Dambata. Um, I'll go straight to Baba Femi Ogungbamola. I hope I got the name right this time. Um, and this will uh, also form your closing remarks. What st yeah. um, strategies, um, we've heard a lot about the local content. What strategies uh, main one employing to leverage on this local content, executive orders, first of all, um, um, one, sorry, 003 and 005, as well as the local content bill, to, and, and also the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation. How can companies like Main One um, benefit or leverage from this particular? Uh, so that's the confusion. Uh, <laughs> I think Kazim, that question is for you. Yeah, I, I, oh, I, oh, 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 I am sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, That's think, actually for Kazi, right. not, not for not for Baba Femi. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I I'm like, okay. Um well um yeah, so local content um essentially there are different uh, aspects to it as the compliance side, uh, which of course, given uh, the position that we occupy as a premium data center uh, infrastructure provider in Nigeria, uh, we, we have to ensure, and also as a uh, connectivity service provider in Nigeria, we have to ensure that we strictly adhere to. Uh, but on the, um, on, the other, on the flip side of it, uh, we've been at the forefront of um, trying to grow capacity locally, I did here, uh, Andela uh, rep on the call talk about um, CCO Bandela and the Yaba initiative and the Southern Valley, which we essentially uh, provided the infrastructure to set up uh, about six, seven years ago with the Lagos State Innovation Council. So we've been at the forefront of that, but we, we are also trying to do a lot more, um, building more capacity, both in terms of training for the people that we have. Uh, we just go around a uh, graduate trainee program where we're bringing a lot of young, talented people uh, into the organization and trying to 
leverage the relationship that we have with global uh, ICT uh, uh, providers and the content providers uh, uh, so that they can pass on a lot of the knowledge that uh, okay. they have internationally to the local skills that we have there. And we continue to support local companies uh, okay. in their services, hosting content, and giving them visibility uh, to the international organization so that they can collaborate and partner and grow their businesses. Okay, thank you very much, Kazim. I think we will go straight to Akin Oye, but we want to learn from the Ekiti example. What next? What next for Ekiti State with respect to um, the foundation that has been set with the right of way? What is next? Uh, thanks. I, I think for me, it's also more an interaction of government. Um, universities or educational institutions and, and the private sector. So for us, the, the flagship project is our Ikiti Knowledge Zone project. It's 1,600 hectares. Um, our focus is attracting some of the best technology companies in Nigeria um, to come out there, set up shop there. Uh, we're also talking to re uh, real estate developers to provide the required residential housing infrastructure. Um, and so the, the pitch really is to companies come out to Ekiti, sit out, um, we can fit out 10, 20,000 people within that, within that knowledge zone. Uh, and as the world continues to go remote, you then don't have to be in what you consider the traditional hubs uh, to serve your domestic or international clients. But I think, to close in total, for me, is it's also ensuring that town and gal start to look a lot more. So we put that location in what we call the education quadrangle, which is equidistant from three of the uh, largest tertiary institutions in the state. Um, and I think that's one thing that we have to do more of. We have to bring in the universities a lot more into this conversation. So in terms of where we deploy fiber, for example, in Ikiti, we're going to start out with, with tertiary institutions, um, large areas with young people, captive markets, etc. So ultimately, I mean, I think government's role is to create an enabling environment and step away from the scene um, and allow the private sector crowding the required investments um, to grow the, the digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Akin Oyebode. I, I couldn't have put it better than what you just um, said. Baba Femi, Ogungba Mola, now we come back to you. Closing remarks, please. Okay, uh, once again, it's Baba Femi Ogungba Mola. <laughs> okay, so um, I think, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, I, I think in, in closing, um, just to um, give some examples of what I was talking about, about um, why what, is, what we are trying to do is to actually create um, uh, creates uh, prosperity, um, uh, uh, fuel innovation, and entrepreneurship. And I want to give you an example of um, uh, the payment industry as it is today. Uh, industry started as a payment company, say, 15, about over 15 years ago. And today, because of that, uh, because of, you know, because the company found a, a problem to be solved, and then found, um, uh, and customers, people that were not, you know, partaking in electronic payments, before we're doing that, uh, this industry now has multiple uh, payment companies, all right, creating jobs, uh, continuing the innovation cycle. And I think the, what has happened now is that COVID is giving us another opportunity to do the same thing, meaning that there are other entrepreneurs, there are other companies, startups that have ideas around, say, for example, education today that I think the government can actually reach out to and make their solutions and services available to schools that are already you know, providing um, uh, 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 you know, uh, schooling online. So again, that's another way to ensure that we're actually um, looking at uh, the, the entrepreneurs and companies that are doing something and supporting them. So it's not just about funding uh, because the challenge, about, challenge with funding is that um, funding can run out. There's no unlimited supply of funding whatever enterprise comes up should be solving a real problem. And it also must be economically viable. If it is not, it will die on its own. It will not be sustainable. So we need to find ways to ensure that we, um, we, we, we give them the right exposure 
so that they can then go and provide those services and then continue to build out. And what then happens is that you then begin to create across the value chain, across the supply chain for that particular industry, multiple uh, opportunities for many other people uh, that, that, we, that we have. I want, I want to end with a point around uh, digital literacy and the skills acquisition. And I think where government should, should focus on uh, a lot also is, is at the foundation. Uh, where, because one of, the, one of the things I see is that, and I think it's something that we need to watch out for, is, the, is, is where we are trying to push as much training to everybody as possible. I think we should start where the training is most, uh, is most necessary and most important, and that's starting from um, the schools, all right? So that curriculum has to be available. The infrastructure has to be available for them. They need to start learning from now, because otherwise, if we don't solve that problem, uh, 10 years from now, we are still back here talking about digital literacy. We shouldn't have to, because okay. again, our, our kids are already learning uh, some of those skills right now. We should continue to uh, support them um, uh, as we go along. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Baba Femi, for putting that and laying the groundwork for uh, Bumi Akinyemiju. Chris Uwaje, who is one of the audience, um, wanted to know how you, we deal with the technology disconnect between the government, the industry, and the academia. Again, I know this was addressed during the first plenary, but um, specifically being mentioned now is the technology disconnect. So could we speak to um, that point while giving closing remarks on this uh, section? Um, um, yes, thank you, Chris, um, for, for, for that question. Um, I, and I think the disconnect just comes down to everything we've been talking about all day that you know is synergy, synergy, synergy. It's collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That's really it. I think the moment we're talking, the moment everybody is talking, the moment everybody is open, the moment everybody is saying it's all about the 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 nation. It's all about prosperity locally. It's all about jobs. I think the the moment that is our you know north star, and that is what we're focused on all the time. Then I think really, um, you know, everything else kind of falls in, in, in place, uh, because at the end of the day, the talent is there, the, the people is there, capital is already coming in. We just need to synergize a little bit uh, um, better. But overall, in terms of the conversation, um, I'm so far I really agree with my other panelists and what everybody has said in terms of the next steps from broadband, you know, infrastructure, the talents, the funding. Uh, and then really, I like what Akin said a lot in terms of like starting with the universities, right? Starting with the universities. I think that's very deep and it's something that is, you know, very, very uh, uh, crucial as we move forward. Thank you very much, Bumi. I'm all like closing, closing comments, please. All right. Um, I think I just want to cap on the fact that we're talking about the digital economy and I think we're all aware of that. The one aspect that most people were not aware of or not paying attention to is the remote aspect, which I said COVID-19 has shown everyone. And I think they're intertwined. So the point I would want to emphasize is as we're building the digital economy and we're doing our investments, we have to realize that the world is looking for talent and they'll be looking for two things in talent, not just digitalization, but the ability to deliver remotely. And so we need to pay attention to that because working okay. remotely is something we need to invest in so that we can you know, serve the entire world and grow our GDP in the non-oil um, sector. Okay, thank you very much, Amoali. And um, this brings us to a close on the second plenary. We've tried as much as possible to deal with the subject of local content, innovation, entrepreneurship, intertwining that with the solid infrastructure pillar of the Nigerian digital economy um, um, policy and strategy. We have discussed very, very critical things. I, um, this is just the beginning of the conversation. We're going to have another webinar um, um, coming up to look more into some of these pillars and do a deep dive because we were not able to um, cover the um, um, as much grounds on the pillars as, as we would want, but we wanted a conversation starter. And this is a conversation starter. We're looking forward to collating and curating all the thoughts. If you've registered, 
for this webinar, you're going to get information um, as to how to get some of the presentation. And also at the end of the process, we will be re releasing a um, um, COVID-19 technology position paper from the Digital Economy uh, Policy Commission. Now, that position paper will capture our thoughts and our plans and our strategies incorporating all the good things that we've talked about. So um, I want to thank everyone who um, spared um, um, time to be with us in this conversation. A lot of people coming in, I, I mean, we're hearing numbers in the region of over 2,000 people who actually tuned in in the YouTube. And we cannot, uh, I want to say thank you all, the audience. We cannot take all your comments, but the most important thing is as far as you've registered for this um, webinar, we will keep you in the loop with respect to communication. And we also want you to know that this is not the end of the conversation. The conversation continues, but more importantly, we are not just doing the public-private dialogue, but we're actually going ahead as an outcome from this particular webinar series to set up a public-private partnership platform that will be domiciled at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. We all are part of that process. We are all private sector people, and we are all putting our heads together in collaboration with the people from government. And we must realize, like Bumi said earlier, that the government is doing a lot. They have put strategies and plans um, out there for private sector to open up the partnerships, and we should leverage on these partnerships. Thank you all for that. And um, we will come back in about one minute for the closing remarks. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank so you. we have come to the end of the webinar, the COVID-19 webinar, which is themed assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the Nigerian digital economy and evolving post-pandemic strategies. In order for us to do this, we put together three strategic outcomes which Bumi presented, and I'll be handing, um, I'll be giving him the opportunity to take the closing remarks and setting the perspectives and the next action points. Over to you, Bumi. Thank you very, very much, uh, Chris. And I want to really recognize Chris. I think you've done an incredible job in moderating the session today. Uh, um, couldn't have asked for a better moderator. Um, I want to really um, um, thank the Honorable Minister um, for honoring our invite. You know, we're extremely grateful. He shared eight pillars of the digital policy and economy. And, um, and if you remember at the beginning of the session, I kind of said one of the objectives from this webinar is the idea of launching a public private partnership platform as one of the desired outcomes. So Honorable Minister Sir, the NESG Digital Economy Policy Commission hereby accepts your proposal to partner and work with you towards developing the Nigeria develop, uh, uh, digital economy. I was really excited to hear that comment from the minister, and we're taking that as a number one action item. Thank you very much. I also want to thank um, uh, Kasim for uh, ably representing the DG of NIDA, and um, we acknowledge the policies that NIDA is creating for this post-pandemic um, um, situation to make Nigeria's ICT uh, uh, environment more competitive globally. So we understand that in the spirit of synergy that the DEPC is going to get an official copy so that the private sector can actually respond. We promise you that within two or three weeks of getting those new policies, the private sector will respond as part of this collaboration framework. Thank you very much. To Juliet of Google, our country director of Google, and also a member of the board of directors of NESG, uh, we'd love to thank you for your contributions in the panel. And also, I forget how many hundred thousand jobs uh, um, uh, of, of uh, sorry, hundred thousand or tens of thousands of people that they're committing to training. So we're going to hold them accountable, and then we really, really love 
that. Um, so Omorale as well, Andela. I know Andela has trained so many people. He's planning to train a lot more. We want to know the number and we want to actually, you know, um, uh, uh, thank you for doing that and continuing to do that and your contributions to the panel as well. Um, Jan, uh, from Certiport, uh, Piercing, also lots of great contributions. We'd like to thank you. Uh, the Honorable, um, <laughs> you know, I think that was a very, very good perspective. I think all entrepreneurs in Nigeria should read that local content uh, paper presentation. So I'm committing on behalf of NESG that we will try to publish this paper, you know, on some platform on the website and take um, public comments from businesses. We will try to consolidate that and send that back to the honorable, um, um, you know, to, to the honorable as well as part of our action item from this meeting. We will use a three week timeline to respond back. So as part of the collaboration, we'd like to um, thank the professor, Professor Fakin Lade from University of Lagos. That speaks to the bridge that we need to make into the university system. But instead of just University of Lagos, the 120 or however many universities we have in Nigeria need to be bridged into this conversation. So we look forward to that collaboration, um, starting with University of Lagos. I'd love to thank our, our Professor Dambata, um, incredible insights, the value of that broadband infrastructure. And most importantly, Prof said, it is all about public private partnerships. So in the spirit of how we ensure that that infrastructure is there, the public private uh, our partnership, I think is a very, very great one that, we're, that the DEPC is going to actually start pushing so that all companies in the telecommunications industry understand that the NCC is ready for business, open for business, and is willing to have the private sector lead all this effort. So that's another action item that we're taking from this webinar. Uh, from Akinyo Yebode, thank you so much for this subnational conversation. We know that to be able to achieve the kind of impact and scale, we have to take it to the state level and the local level. And that all started by the kinds of um, tariff changes that are happening. So the question is, what are all the other five policies, five changes that are gonna happen from a subnational level? We look forward to it and the private sector will engage at the subnational you know, level. Uh, thanks to Main One and to InterSwitch, they pretty much exemplify innovation and entrepreneurship from a local content standpoint. Now we want 50 of them, 100 of them, 2000 of them, to actually come out of Nigeria. And I think we will have the prosperity and the jobs that we're looking for. Essentially, I'm gonna wrap up by saying that we're looking forward to taking this further by actually cementing the conversation we had today through some kind of model roundtable with public sector, private sector that results in an MOU that is signed by all parties with KPIs and the PMO or secretariat that stewards the process until it's completed, you know, and executed and it's managed so that all of our future webinars are actually not talk, but really more around what have we done since the last conversation and how are we doing in terms of the execution of the imperatives around adopting full digital economy in a post, you know, pandemic situation. So I'd like to thank all of the panelists I'd like to thank the audience for engaging all through, incredible the number of people that tuned in, incredible the number of comments. We hope to find a way to respond to the comments, hopefully in the next um, um, webinar. Uh, and I'd like to finally thank the board and the management of NESG for giving us this platform to volunteer and, um, and, and to do what is right for the country, right? It's a volunteer role. We're all doing this in the interest of, of the country. And I will close by asking that everybody hearing this, you can volunteer. We're looking for volunteers who want to help in every aspect of this work, right? From a private sector standpoint. To volunteer, send an email to info at nesggroup.org. Ensure that the subject line says volunteer for DEPC or Digital Economy Policy Commission. Thank you very much. And we will um, mark this uh, webinar close as I pass it on 
back on to Chris. Thank you very much, Bumi. I don't think after the summary you made, I have anything else to say. I just want to say you guys have been awesome. Thank you, particularly for lending your time professionally. So um, till the next one, have a great day, everyone. <laughs>